What is happening, everybody? Welcome back to another Tour Life. It is October 18th, and boy, do we have a lot to get into today. Ricky Wysocki wins yet another Tour Championship, making it his third only player to do so. We have uh, him joining the show to hear just about how that, how big of an accomplishment that was and how his season went from very rocky in the beginning to finishing it off pretty, pretty solid. We also have on-course reporter Brian Earhart jo joining in the show for the first time. Uh, very curious to talk to him about what the Disc Golf Network, what their plans are for next season, what his plans are, and hear all behind the scenes of what is going on with the Disc Golf Pro Tour. Then we have Calvin Heinberg, who is my player of the year for 2023. We'll see if Yuli agrees with me. He will be joining the show as well. Uh, we've got to talk about the Katrina Allen, Jessica Weiss altercation that happened. We got to talk about all these big names. I thought last season there was a lot of player movement this season. When you guys hear this list of the names that are potentially on the move or up for contracts, it is a wild list, but Yuli, before we get into it, brother, how are you doing? My man, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I'm in Michigan right now doing some team stuff, working on a few things over here at the Discraft factory. Uh, and yeah, we just came off of the big week, the big, I guess it was like three weeks of total chaos in my house. A lot of people staying there for the tour championships, us championships. So yesterday was the first day where my house was quiet. That was nice. I got to enjoy that for a day. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, still grinding, but trying to smooth into the off season. I feel you. Uh, I got to go to yet another Raiders game. Uh, do I say the Raiders are back? Dark horse playoff contenders three and three. We've got the bears coming up. We've got the giants coming up. We might be looking pretty nasty here in a few weeks. Uh, both teams are terrible though. I, I just want to put that out there. The New York Patriot, uh, the New England Patriots are terrible. Mac Jones. If you're, if you're a Patriots fan, Mac Jones is not the answer. He's folding like a cheap lawn chair, man. He really he, is. He, I mean, when Kelsey comes to me and talks to me about quarterback play, that's when, you know, that's when you know you're in <laughs> trouble. Um, so we'll see, we'll see what the Patriots are doing, uh, moving forward. Uh, but yeah, I, it's been a good week down here. It's kind of hot actually right now, surprisingly really? kind of hot for Vegas. Um, update. I am no longer training for the marathon. A couple things kind of came up from that. First one being Kelsey's not going to be able to join me because she has a uh, game that that day. Second one being because she has a game that day, it is her last game of the season. I don't want to miss it, right? I want to go to see every single game I can possibly go playing the Broncos. I want to see that. And then thirdly, um, I was kind of thinking about it. I was like, do I want to be spending, you know, a lot of my off season, like running, <laughs> like some of these runs are going to be, I'm going to be running for like two plus hours, you know? And yeah. with me streaming on Twitch again, me getting in the gym, me uh, playing, practicing, there's not really that much time in the day. So I was like, man, I don't know if I want to waste that much. So I'm doing a 5k. I'm doing one of those like polar plunges. So we run around and we finish right at a community pool and then you just freaking belly flop baby right into it. So that's what I'm training for. It'll be in that January. Sounds, so that sounds Have you really done enjoyable one to me. No, but that sounds way better than a marathon. Yeah. But the marathon is the Disney marathon. You get to run through all yeah. the parks. Pretty fire. Um, but yeah, that's what I've been up to this week. Uh, but yeah, enough about us, Yuli. Let's jump into it. Tour championship recap. Yep. We had essentially two, two tournaments inside of one big tournament. You had the semifinals, which is the first two days. And then if you qualified out of that scores reset and you went into the finals, talk to me real quick about just your experience with the tour championship, the new format, all those things. Um, my experience was good. I mean, I played, I obviously I got to play the first two rounds. I didn't make it. or wasn't even close to making it into, into the, the second half of the tournament, but my experience was good. I mean, the first day, the feeling was for me personally was like, 
there's a chance, but you didn't know what the scores were going to be, you know? And then I was like, I kind of started off like flat and bad. And so I was looking at scores and nobody was really shredding. So I'm like, if I could scrap out a decent score, nothing's like set in stone, you know? And that's the type of course I felt early on that you could just get hot on. And if you got five, six, seven birdies in a row, all of a sudden you're in and you can kind of pad your score all the way to, you know, to the, uh, I guess it would be the finals. Um, that didn't happen for me. I shot a one under first round, which was 14 shots better than my practice round. So that was a plus, but I found myself in like 15th, I think 15th place, which wasn't that bad. And then the second round there, I've double bogeyed the second hole. So I was immediately one over par for the tournament and it got to a point where I, where I tried, tried, tried. And then at a certain point, you're just out of it all of a sudden. And you're like, however many back and you're just kind of out there (laughs) stuck on the course being like, I don't want to do, or I don't know what to do. Like, what am I supposed to do? Keep trying my hardest. Like, this is the weirdest feeling ever. Luckily I had a really cool card and, uh, Conrad and I, Conrad had an outside chance of making it. And we were talking Mm -hmm. about it. We had like four holes left and we're like, all right, let's just play for 20 bucks last four holes. Cause that's where we were at. It was at a spot with our whole card to where Bino was kind of in it. And we're all like kind of rooting him on. And then all of a sudden he took a double bogey and he was gone. (laughs) And so our whole cards out there, like with four holes left, like, what are we doing? Like, can we just like not do this anymore? Was there and any so money we, difference between um, placement none. or did everyone get the same? None, which is one of the things I want to talk about is the format Yikes. because I think it's silly. I think yeah. it's really silly to be out there and like, this is, so let me finish. No my point. So, we're, so we're playing and then we're playing for like 20 bucks and we finished and I got a couple good birdies down the stretch. I ended up burning 16 and 17, which are really tough. I went for 18 and I bogeyed it, which is like obvious what was going to happen the whole time. And, uh, I got like 29th or whatever. And then the same day or the next day I'm or the same day I'm watching, uh, I'm doing the commentary on, on what's going on. And I see on the live before the commentary, I see like, uh, Nicholas and Proctor have this moment on 18 to where they basically both have to make their putts just to get in. And Nicholas misses his barely Proctor airballs his over the top of the basket and ends up missing it, which puts Nicholas back in. And I'm like sitting there. And then I realized like, dude, I make just as much as James Proctor. And I was like, nowhere near. I was like nine holes into the turn, the tournament of the third round being like, I'm done. <laughs> like, what am I doing out here? <laughs> and that's a crazy thought. You know what I mean? Because obviously Proctor beat me and beat me by probably like 10 shots or something. Yeah. Why, he ended up why finishing did, at five under. So why are we so about eight why, shots better? Yeah. So why are we playing for the same amount of money? Like that was wild to me. That was a wild format because through the duration of the tournament, you're going to have probably more than half the players, well, probably about half the players that just don't have a shot. And then the guys who actually have a shot, who are like putting in their best effort, they're still making the same as the person who shot as a uh, Mason Ford, who quit the tournament. He gets the same amount of money as Proctor who missed the 30 footer to possibly get 40 grand. Like that's crazy to me. Mm-hmm. So it was kind uh, of a wild experience, honestly. Yeah, no, I could see that. I mean, there was a lot. We're going to dive into that. I don't know if we'll have time before Ricky comes on, and maybe we can actually talk to Ricky about it too. Um, Or we can, if you want, we can do it right now. I don't care. There was was some major issues with, like, the spectators there. The crowd was, like, non-existent from what I saw – an FPO. And then what people sent me, I was at the game obviously on Sunday, but I had people send me photos of the crowd on Sunday and it was not good. It, I, and I don't know, I'm trying to think why you're, you're from there. You know, you live not too far away from that course. Do you have any insight on what may cause or what might've caused, 
you know, people just not showing up to this tournament. I mean, the format's weird. It really is. You think the it's format's... a format issue? I think possibly. I think if it's a real tournament to where this is what I think they should do with, with the tournament. I think that if it was an actual tournament and you had the Saturday, Sunday, and everybody's still in it, people would come out those days. Just like at the USDGC, people come out. Some people come out Thursday. Some people come out Friday. Most of the people are coming out Saturday and Sunday. Mm -hmm. But when there's 12 guys, you, you think you're going to bring as much as the USDGC brings? You get so what you I mean? Think this, do you think this kills my argument of the thought? I was like, maybe the pro tour should just take like the top 50 guys and take them on tour and just focus on that. Keep costs down because it's not as many people. Do you think that is the main reason people didn't show up is because there's only 12 people and maybe their favorite players not playing or whatever it may be? I think that, and I think a big part of it is, dude, this, the people get the same amount of money. Mm. Like there's like, well. I don't know what the hype's all about except for the final day anyway. Like if I was a fan, I would want to come out for the final day and watch somebody win 40,000. Sure. I don't know what happened because I was out there too. There wasn't a lot of fans. There really wasn't. Um, yeah. I'm not sure. Maybe because it was so close to the USDGC, people went there and spent their money. And then it was like the week after you're playing the pro tour championships, are they going to double dip or did they get there? Did they get, you know, like, like for example, I feel like this is a good example. If there was a PGA tour tournament, in Charlotte and I went and saw one, one weekend, would mm -hmm. I want to go see another the next weekend? Probably not. Now I was trying to remember, do you remember the, the time difference between last year's USDGC and same. Tour Championship? I'm pretty sure it was the same. I think it was, it was a week just... after. Okay. Because I, I think do it's remember always the... a week after from photos, like judging from photos from, you know, whole 18 last year to whole 18 this year, there was a significant drop and you know, I don't know what the cause of that was. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I obviously USDGC is the big show in town. And the question is like, does the tour championship maybe need to go somewhere else? So they're not tapping in. And that brings me to another story. Another story that came out was, uh, this was posted in a local Facebook page, I believe. Um, the Charlotte area disc golf page. This was posted. It says, what's up everyone due to an unprecedented number of no shows. We are in dire need of help today for the DGPT championship. If you are free, please consider coming to Nevin park and lending a hand for three or four hours this afternoon. If you're able to just come to the park and let the front gate attendant know you're volunteering, they will let you know where to park. Uh, please see the picture below to find out where to check in. I mean, this, this is like a cry for help. Was there, was there a big issue out there with volunteers not showing up? I don't, think, it, I don't think I didn't notice that at all. I felt like it was fine. There's not really a lot of places where you need spotters or anything. So I, I, mm -hmm. I don't think so. It's not a course to where, you know, you throw a bunch of blind shots and you're going to lose your disc. There's like one or two holes where that might possibly happen. But no, I don't think that was the issue. I don't know what the issue is, Brody. I, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. It's not because... good for, I mean, this is the disc golf pro tours main, they don't have a major, right? So this is the disc golf pro tours main tournament that they want to push. And I'll tell you too, the numbers, the numbers weren't good. When I was watching live, the numbers were not impressive of the amount of people watching it live. We'll see what like the I Jomez really, numbers are, but I really think that back-to-back -back big tournaments is never a good idea, it's tough. especially in the same area. I mean, there's no way, like I said, I'm not going to go see two PGA tour events. I don't care if they're both majors back-to-back. -back. Like that's never going to happen for me. And I'm a big time golf fan. Would you, would you just be like, okay, no. yeah, I'm going every single day for this was, one. I would just pick whichever one I liked more. Exactly. Next year is going to be so, very interesting too, right? Cause it's going to be sandwiched in between the USDGC and the champions cup which yeah. is like not super far away from Charlotte. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. I, I guess but it's maybe a different state. There's a whole different amount of people. I feel like that'll go to that. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, it was it was bizarre. I also think that the format is crazy. Like, yeah, it, like I, want, whole, I, want, I was gonna say yeah. I want to I want to hold off a little bit on the format stuff because I'm really curious to see what Ricky has to say about it. Um, you know, him being him winning it the back the last two years. I don't think the stroke stuff was as crazy as people thought it was going to be. Like, I don't think it's as an advantage at all, actually. And I, I'm actually curious to hear what Calvin has to say that like, for, like for him to do what he did this season to then have like a two stroke lead. And then all of a sudden that just like evaporates and like, that's just gone for like the next, I don't know if that's that big of an advantage. Should it, should there be more of an advantage? I do think that the, the course we played was awesome for this kind of tournament. So I you're, really you're do. a fan. I'm a big fan of that course because I, I might've said this before, but I love the fact that somebody can do what Adam did and be out of it and shoot a really great score and then get into it. We don't see that very often. We don't have courses good enough that apply that type of stroke separation. Like you get eight in a row when you're gaining on everybody in the field for the most part, it seemed like people started figuring out at the end, but I mean, Adam was so far out of it. He was like two over par or something after the first You're not going to like this, Yuli. It was awful to spectate on coverage. Yeah. Lot. It was. Oh, I could I, understand I, that. Yeah. I, uh, we got to hole. Um, gosh, what was it? Hole 10 or hole 11. I was live. I was doing like a companion stream. So I was live streaming my, you know, I was watching it. People were like in chat. We were all talking yeah. while I was watching it. And I got to like whole 10 or 11. I, I looked at everyone. I was like, this is bad guys. But like, I, I need to like take a nap. Like I need to get out of here. Like I'm, I'm over watching this. Yeah. It was, it, we talk about like shots, 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 like show me more shots on covers. Cause I feel like at the beginning of the year, they were showing like everything, but shots. And like they were cutting to the booth a whole lot and just showing like Terry and Nate Doss and stuff talking. And then they went to this tournament. There's not that many players on the course. And they were literally just going from one person to the next one and like not even setting up any shots. It wasn't even like, Oh, on this hole, this is what you should be looking for. It, it almost felt like they were scared to show anything that wasn't live. And so gotcha. it got almost to the point of where like I was seeing 60 shots within like five minutes. And I'm just like overload of information. I don't know what the heck's going on. I don't know. It wasn't for me. I don't, I, I don't know if everyone else thought the same. I didn't feel that when I was doing the Jomez coverage, I really enjoyed the, the Jomez coverage that I got to commentate on. So I feel like that's different than live. It is. Right? It it's is. Not the same. I didn't watch the live because I, I wanted a kind of a fresh perspective of, of what was going on on the Jomez. Cause um, you guys are going channel. through like the drone footage of the hole, right? Like you're For seeing sure. the hole, yeah. like there's good pacing there. This, yeah. this pacing man was, was intense. It felt like, it felt like I was watching the red zone for disc golf for like four hours straight. It's intense, but I love the it red was, zone. <laughs> yeah. You do love the red zone too, but you also football. The only difference is you, you kind of understand like they're on the 10 yard line what they're trying to, you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it would just cut to someone and I'd have no idea where he's throwing the disc, what he's trying to do. I don't know. It got, it got a there's, little bit out of hand. There's that, but it was the first time in a long time where I was completely out of it. And I was still fighting because if I got the last nine, I'm in, if I got mm -hmm. the last eight, I'm in, if I got the last seven, I might be in, if I got the last That's five. I could be in. You know That's what I mean? The and problem so, with disc golf right now, man, is like the best courses are the worst ones to to watch on coverage. Yeah. I feel like. But as a player, like there's a lot of places that we play to where you're if you're done. down by if you're down by seven strokes and you haven't gotten the first five out of six, you're, you're getting lapped. Yeah. Yeah. You're freaking done. Yeah. Um Nicholas Antilla was actually the uh the only player that didn't have a stroke advantage that ended up making it to the finals. Um, Not surprising. Yeah. He played, he played pretty solid to get in. Uh, but yeah, it did, it did look like the advantage did help some, like obviously it didn't help everyone. Right. Simon had a uh, three strokes on the majority of the field. He didn't make it. There was a couple other players that had stroke advantages going into it that ended up not making it as well. 
Um, but we'll leave the rest of the format talk to Ricky, who's going to be hopping on here for a second. But speaking of Ricky, let's pop up some of these photos real quick. The dudes won this three, this tournament now three times. The only player to have done so he now is back to back winners of the tour championship. There is something about this tournament, watching him play that final round, seeing the highlights after the fact it, something about this tournament brings out a different level, a, a different animal in Ricky. Right. And yeah. I don't know what it is. I'm very curious to kind of hear from him, but it seems like he loves this tournament so much and uh, very, very curious. Um, I am retired again, letting everyone know I am retired from trophy rating. Yuli, if you have anything to say about the trophies, uh, Silas can throw the photo up again with Ricky. If you wanted to comment on it, I don't You're have setting me any... up, dude. No, no, I'm just saying I, I'm yeah. retired. I can't. That's I a can't, setup, man. I'm sorry. I can't I see say I know anything. Setup I am, when I, when I I am retired from trophy rating. Uh, so if you want to say anything about you it. You got me into a big mess because now every single trophy that's posted, I get tagged in it. And they're like, <laughs> they're like, you, you got to give us your rating for this. I'm like, dude, I'm going to stay hands off with that, man. Congrats, Rick. What a win. This is. <laughs> this is not a rating. This is not a rating at all. All I'm going to say is I think someone stepped on the box that had the trophies because there is, there is a, there's a, there's a crease. There's a, there's a uh, bent. They're bent in the same spot. Yeah. I don't think that was by that. design. Um, How about we just ask, ask Rick where, where it ranks in the, tr all the, you know, hundreds of trophies that he's won. We'll just okay. ask where it ranks. That's, fair, fair. that's a safe bet. Um, all right. Let's talk Missy Gannon real quick. Missy Gannon takes down. Uh, she does not crack when the money is, when the money's up. Big right? money when, Missy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do you like that nickname? Are you a fan of that? I think I am. Okay. Fair enough. You are? Um, I, it's whatever. It's if, if she likes it, then that's fine. That's all that matters. Right. <laughs> I watched yeah, I this fi I watched this final round. I watched the 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 final nine holes, and I got to tell you, yes, we have seen in the past players more more so on the FPO side than the MPO side, but we have seen players in other tournaments, you know, make mental mistakes, crack under the kind of the pressure. We saw so much more of that at this tournament, and I think that is a byproduct of the money. I think a hundred percent these people are thinking about if I go from first place to second, that's I'm losing $18,000. They are thinking about that where before it's like, ah, if I get fifth place or if I get 10th place, it's, it's $200 difference. Who really cares? Mm -hmm. This is a factor and Missy, it does not bother her. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely see that. And I actually saw it with Bradley Williams at the USDGC. Cause he's coming down the stretch and he lays up a putt on 14. And the guy was putting out of his mind. It seemed like the whole tournament and he laid one up from, he was safe in front of the hay bales. How far is that? Like pin high. Oh, that can't be so more 35 feet at most laid it up. And then he ends up losing by one. Yeah. And you think like, is if this was a normal tournament where the payouts aren't crazy, are you laying but, that putt up? Exactly. Which, which at, at a point you do have to, you do have to think about that eventually. Yes. hundred percent. For sure. Yeah. Like that's a lot of money. There's a big difference between 20,000 and I, what was it? 12. I don't know. I don't know what the uh, oh, for second is, place but, for, Oh, you're talking about USCDC. Yeah. I think it was, I think it was 20 and 12, something like that. $8,000 difference. Yeah. Big, big difference plus your bonus and everything. And I saw him lay that putt up and I'm thinking to myself, wow, because then down the stretch, he's just trying to hold his second place. Like he makes a putt and he does this to where a person who's trying to win the tournament, in my opinion, making a putt like that and you're trying to track somebody down. Now, at this point, Kyle's way ahead. Mm -hmm. Like you're trying to throw some energy at that guy. You know what I mean? Something. You make a big putt out out of the circle. You want to. You either need to be stone cold, or you need to throw some energy at that guy. Not 
I felt like it was a, it was a sign of relief. Like, Oh, it's in. Okay. I'm still good. You know, Mm -hmm. type thing. I don't know. But with Missy, you're right, man. (laughs) She doesn't, she doesn't care. She wins those big checks. We didn't really see anything too at the end of the tour championship because there was, I mean, obviously Kyle was pressing Ricky, but it would have been really interesting to see if there was someone in third close by, because looking on hole 18, I mean, you had people take numbers on that hole final day. You had a double bogey. You had five. I mean, I'm not going to count Ricky's double because he was laying up, but you had a double bogey and five bogeys on that hole. So that hole was playing a two stroke swing. And then yeah. the, uh, in the semifinals, I mean, you had people taking nines, eights, so it would have been really interesting to see how players would have played that if there was tight right down the stretch of like, yeah. do I press to try to win or do I just secure, well, you know, $10,000 more in cash? Yeah. I mean, I, I know that uh, there was a conversation between Isaac and Adam on the last hole mm. to where they were like, Hey, what are you doing here? And they were, mm. and then Isaac's like, I'm laying this up. And Adam was like, I'm laying it up too. And so then they're playing like layup game to the thing and they tie back and forth, you know, but that would have been interesting if he says that. And then Adam just goes for it. You know what I mean? Cause he knows that he's laying up. Yeah. That, that doesn't happen at a a normal elite event where they're playing for seventh place. That doesn't, those conversations, those thought processes happen all the time. Like I might say, I might save this story for Ricky, but it used to have, cause I have a hilarious story of, yeah, save of for Ricky, Rick. Rick, save of for Ricky Rick. and He's I come- uh, playing in a playoff that I can't wait to tell the world. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's my that. favorite Ricky story. But back in the day when we would tie for first, we were all, I would never split right away. I would never be like, Hey, let's chop and we'll go to the playoff and play for the trophy. I never did that. I was always like, Hey, I'll take a little bit off the top because there was always a big difference between first and second back in the day. Sometimes it was thousands of dollars or thousand dollars, which is a lot of money back then, Mm -hmm. you know, or it's like $500 at a B tier. And then second place is like 200 and you, and you go, Hey, I'll take a a hundred off the top. First gets four, second gets three. I'm I'm good with that, you know, that way, because we're paying for gas money, you know? Yeah. Well, that's that's what it seems like the trend or or, or kind of how the money has worked these last few years, right? It seems like at one point, the contracts that you had outside of disc golf weren't what they are now. And so yeah. your tournament money was so important to you. And then now, or a few years ago, we were in the po- point where contract money and sponsorship money outside of purse money was so much bigger than purse money that yeah. no one really cared about purse money. But now we're seeing at some of these events, no matter how big your contract is, right? 40,000 is 40,000, unless you're yeah. making millions and millions. And even then, 40,000, still $40,000. Like that changes things. So we're kind of seeing the purses catch up now. And then we're getting back to where those things yep. matter. Cause I think at a certain port part, those things didn't really matter. And that's why you had players just p- playing for first and being like, I'm either playing for first or last. It's, I don't care. I think you might, might see a little bit of a shift as those uh, purses continue to grow. It's a crazy thing though, Brody. I've never in my life. I have never played and worried about like, the money compared to the win. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you can, it's never like, it's never been like, Oh my gosh, I'll play different. You You know what I'm saying? You would for sure. If, if you had a putt, if you had a putt on hole 18, that could go out of bounds, right? Let's say it's 60 feet. You make it, you win the tournament, you, you miss it and it goes out of bounds, right? you now drop from second place to like, let's say fourth or fifth. And that changes like 400, $370,000, something like that. There's no way. No, it wouldn't. There, it, there would be some people that would mind. think about that. There yeah. would be some people that would think about that. Maybe not you, but there would yeah. be some people that think about that. Maybe what they're you not. think about it? Um, I would for sure. I might, I might put, I might put a little bit differently. Right. And maybe try to secure a playoff at least. You know, and maybe a putt's a little bit, maybe a putt's well, a little bit of a different thing, no, but how about, how about a, it's gotta be a putt to tie. Yeah. It's interesting. I don't know. I, I wouldn't, 
So I've never been in that situation, so I don't so really know. Same, it's, it's, I think it's easy sometimes to say that. So, so say it, it's exactly what you're saying, but it's a 60 footer to tie to at the U S championship on 18, or you lay mm-hmm. it up to guaranteed second. There's no way you lay that up. And that's I think it like depends whole, on who you are. I think it depends whole, on who you are. Yeah, but you, I'm saying you. Is there any way you could be okay with yourself by laying up a putt on no, hole I'm, 18 at the U.S. Championships? Because that one's going. It's going. Like, you're not saving a stroke if you run that putt. That's a great yeah. example. Yeah, no, I am I am probably I am probably running that, but I'm, I'm not going to say everyone is. You know? No, you're right. I think I think there are still some people that would would make the business decision of, hey, this cash matters a lot, so maybe I give it a a chance to go in, but I'm not risking like a double bogey here and losing hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, it's uh, it, I don't know. It's an interesting question and one that like again, as the money gets higher and higher, yeah. more and more people get to have that question because obviously, if you're making a million dollars. And then you go to a tournament and the difference between first and second is $5,000. That probably isn't going to make or break your decision making. But if you're making a million dollars in the first and second, it's a hundred thousand dollars. And yeah, I think, I think people start thinking about that. So uh, last story. Well, we're going to talk about the Katrina Allen and Jessica Weiss thing at the end. Cause I think Ricky is signing on right now, but uh, last story I have here, Kyle Klein, biggest month ever, $52,000. He made in the month of October had himself quite a bit of a nice That's little a nice month. October. Um, I don't know if he has a house, but if he does and you're in his neighborhood, uh, he should be giving out full size candy bars for Halloween. <laughs> he better be full size candy bars. That's that. And it should be in a big bowl saying, uh, please take one. He's still a puppy though. He might be going out and trick or treating. How old is he? No, he's Dude, like I, twenty. He's got. He's I mean, got to be twenty. Is he only twenty? When, when can you? I don't. Yeah, I think he might be twenty. When? When can? That's when so do you young. have to stop trick or treating? Because I feel like I was trick or treating. I definitely trick or treated my freshman year in college. When I came back home for Halloween, I definitely went out with my brother. <laughs> I think. It, I think it's different if you have a younger sibling too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, big, I'll throw big that time. as a caveat. Um, all right, we got Ricky in the wings. Let's bring him in here. Your three time. Back to back tour champion winner, Ricky Wysocki joins tour life. Ricky, what's up, man? How's it going, guys? Thanks Dude, for having chilling. me. I'm glad, to, glad to join you guys. All right. First, guys, what is with this tournament? What what makes this tournament like it, you feel like you just like come alive this tournament and do things that are just unimaginable? What is it about the tour championship that just gets you going? I don't know. I think I think for me, it's it's something where you want to go into the off season with a, a positive thought, and it's and it's like you get to think about that last tournament for the whole season or the whole off season. And so I think that for me, that's gives me that little extra motivation to really want to um, go out there and just give it your all. All right, Yuli had some words leading into the tournament. He said. Uh... He said that Nevin is more difficult than Northwoods Black. So I want to hear if he still thinks that. And I also want to hear from you what, what, with all the changes that they did at the course this year, where do you have it as far as like course difficulty with the courses we played on tour? Yeah. I mean, I think it's at very least it's right there neck and neck, but I w I would say it probably is harder. It's to, um, just, I think the gaps and in, in everything out there are, are trickier. I think, um, I think, you know, there's a lot more big numbers on like every hole. Uh, Nevin, there's, you pick, you could pick maybe like half the course where you get a big number. Nevin, you could pretty much get a big number on almost any hole. And especially with the fact that they cleaned up uh, Northwoods, they, they trimmed, you know, I'd say, let's say 10 feet on the left and right side uh, of the, a lot of the fairways, they trimmed a lot of the trees. So it made it a lot easier to scramble when you're out of position uh, than it used to. Uh, I think what Kyle had the record for, for a while at like seven under. And, you know, I think now once we go there year after year, you're going to see people shooting eight, 10 under. And um, I think, whereas at Nevin, you know, me and Calvin shot, Calvin shot a nine, I shot a 10. Um, but those are, those are just great rounds. And, and those are just rounds where you're smooth sailing and that you can't expect to do that every time out there at Nevin. 
Well, let's talk about that 10 under round. Where, where do you put that? I mean, we, you went, um, you went 10 under, and then also I want to talk a little bit about the final day, six out of seven circle two putting. You almost were perfect. You started your day making a, what I would call like a, Hey, I'm going to throw one up there and see if it gets close you might be thinking other than that might be different than what you're thinking. Uh, but I mean, you were draining putt after putt after putt. So talk to me about that 10 under round first and just what, what, where does that stack up with your rounds throughout this season? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's right there with my 15 under at the preserve, I would say just because of the, the course difficulty difference between the preserve and Nevin. Uh, I think it's very comparable as far as how it felt and how, you know, Obviously, the ratings are kind of whack um, <laughs> because it's it's pretty obvious that that ten under should you know based on the ratings uh, in the past. And I think I think something people don't mention is I think ratings used to be a lot more accurate than they are now because of the fact that there's so many good players. And when that's the case, it actually makes the rating system worse. Uh, and 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 I, because everybody's just so compact. And it just throws off the equation or something. I don't know what it is, but it just kind of seems like that. We don't uh, have those bad players anymore that make courses look harder than they actually are. Yeah, for sure. So it's, and it's, it's almost impossible now to shoot some of the round ratings that people were shooting, you know, a few years ago when we had 900, 950 rated guys that were shooting, you know, 20 over par and stuff. So yeah, I agree I, with you on that. I be, you basically come out and say that if you shoot the hot round of the of, of that of that round, let's just say a random random DGPT event, that that round should be rated 1070, 1080 almost automatically, just because of the skill set. Whereas you couldn't say that 10 years ago. You know, if if the top couple players played bad, it's not going to be a 1080. But nowadays, it's almost guaranteed that you, that you have to shoot that good to get a rating like that. Well, not, not only that, but these days, like you have to shoot so much better and they're lower. You know what I mean? Like, like nowadays in order to get the hot, hot round of the, like, I think back in the day I would average like a hot round of tournament or something, something like that. And nowadays I average zero hot rounds a year. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Uh-huh. And so like in order to get a hot round at a tournament, you're going to have to shoot between 12 and 13 every single round in order to get the hot round. Because like you said, Ricky, the, the competition is so tight that somebody's doing it. There's somebody who's going to do it. Are you, are you guys still judging your rounds off the rating? Like when you finish your rounds, are you guys going to PDGA and looking at what, what that rated? No. I mean, I think I stopped doing that, you know, I would say eight, 10 years ago. I mean, sometimes you'll be like, oh, you shot a good round and it's cool to, to be like, all right, that's, that's kind of cool. But I'm not like, I'm not like, oh, sweet. What did I shoot? What was my rating? And I think partly it's because it's, it's kind of off now. I mean, uh, and, and I think that it just kind of lost its, um, you know, it used to be, it used to be really cool. It did. And I think it was a cool way to judge, but now you have hot rounds and you even, do interviews and explaining, explaining around how, how it played out. And so that's more, more so instead of, you know, back in the day, it was like, all right, you shot a 1080 and that's pretty much all, all they had with it. They didn't have the poster on interviews to explain how did it feel all this different stuff that you have now. And so I think that that takes away from the ratings and how much people really value it. Going back to like the, comparisons of the two courses northwoods black and nevin i think one of the biggest differences is that nevin has a lot of bone what feels like a bonus birdie to where northwood black you can play like decent shots and kind of scramble your way to a birdie on almost every hole out there to where at nevin like you have to throw pure shots in order to get the birdies and it's usually like a 400 foot like pure shot to where Nevin, you can get off, scramble a sidearm, and then throw like a 380 shot in to where, you know, like every hole at, at beside, what is it, like hole one, hole two to start Nevin, not so much, but even hole three. I mean, that used to be a par five. It's a par four now. That's like a bonus birdie ish. And then you go to the par threes that are like 400 foot dead straight, the one that's 400 foot up the hill. Then you go to 17 and 18. It's like, there's like, 
seven holes out there, when you get a birdie, it's like you, you might be one of five people, six people in the tournament to get it. Yeah. I think that they're both, they're both very comparable. And like you said, the, the bonus birdies are, are definitely there and you're gaining strokes, which on nowadays yep. on tour, you birdie holes, you're just, you're just not losing strokes. You may not necessarily gain strokes yep. on some of the holes and depending on how hard it is. But in general, if you break down a course, there's going to be a huge chunk of players that birdie that same hole you did. So you got to string together birdies. Uh, whereas at Nevin, you know, it's the type of round where, you know, ideally you'd want to go birdie, par, par, birdie, par, par, you know, and string them like that, as opposed to preserve where you're, can I get eight in a row and give myself a chance to have the hot round? Uh, mm -hmm. And so I right. think that that's kind of the name of the game out there. Something that was talked about a lot this tournament was the actual format, right? We play, they, they got rid of the match play this year. So all year, we're either playing three round tournaments or four round stroke play tournaments. And then we get to the tour championship and it's a completely different format. What, what were your thoughts on the format? I, I think they did better with doing it two rounds. I always did think it was weird to play all season and then just have one round uh, to, to determine the tour champion. So I think the fact that it's two rounds. You're saying basically like the, bo the way that the buys and stuff worked, you're making it to like the, the top guys could just really only just have to play one round is what you're saying mm -hmm. last year. Yeah, exactly. Um, cause, cause the way you get a buy, and I guess it's not automatic last year. I guess I'm just talking about more so this year. Um, but, uh, I like that, uh, compared to just one round. I think that's, you know, I'm, I'm all for a new, new format, but, um, I think that just playing one round, uh, like you said, with the fact that we're playing three and four rounds all year, and then you just do a one round tournament. It just feels kind of, kind of weird. Did you like the reset after two? Yeah, I think, I think it's cool. I think that, you know, that gives, it's not, you're not guaranteed to make the finals as a top seed. Most of us did. I think the only person that didn't was Simon. So I think most of, most people made the finals. And it, so that was your advantage is just that much easier. You still have to earn it. You still have to go out there and play, uh, but it's not a guarantee. It's not like a buy. So I think that it gives the people that maybe didn't, they just squeaked in. It still gives them an outside chance if they play, if they play hot like what Adam did. Um, but you have to play really well because ob obviously as we, as we're talking about, you know, if you're, if I'm getting four strokes and dude in 15th place is getting none, like that's a lot to come up uh, and well, make up. What about this Ricky? I was talking to Brody earlier about this and my, one of the big problems I had with the format, which you didn't have to deal with was I'm like halfway through my round and there's nothing to play for. Like I'm getting the same amount as the next person. And that, to me, it's a travesty because then you have James Proctor, who has a 30 footer on the last hole, who absolutely destroyed me in the tournament. He misses it, and we get the same amount of money. Like, I don't think that's fair. Like, that guy deserves a lot more money than I did. We don't deserve the same thing. And then half the field with, you know, nine holes, or some people didn't even show up, or one person didn't even show up because he was so out of it, maybe, or he was hurt. Hopefully, he was hurt. But I don't know. I, I felt like that was strange. I, I, you shouldn't have yeah. players like have nothing to play for towards the end of the round. For sure. I think, I think I'm all, I'm an advocate for the point system. You know, it gives commentators and spectators something to, you know, kind of drama towards the middle and end of the year. Like who's going to win the points title. You know, you have a payout for that. And, you know, you can do in addition, you could do a separate tournament like the pro tour finals, but I think there should be a lot more emphasis on those points. I think, cause obviously, as we know, it's hard to, to play well at a high level consistently week in and week out. And I yeah. think that eventually down the road, I'd love to see a big payout that uh, adds a whole extra storyline to all these events. Yeah, no, I, I've, heard, I've definitely heard that before that there should just like Calvin should have just won a certain amount of money. You should have won a certain amount of money. And, and somebody like Proctor who, you know, he beat me at every single tournament and beat me at the pro tour championships. And we made the same amount. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like that's just not fair for how well he played the whole season compared to how well I played the whole season. For sure. And I, th and I think it's kind of, it's something we're going to have to kind of, you know, cause I, I get it. It's hard to get the money for the, 
pro tour finals and then also give out a payout for the yeah. for the points title and so i guess we're just gonna kind of have to find a happy medium between the two yeah and uh it, jeff spring mentioned that he that this format will most likely come back next year but with some extra tweaks so i don't know what tweaks that means something that i personally would like to see from watching it i wasn't a big fan of the reset I, I I wasn't a big fan of the reset. I wasn't a big fan of the cut. And also I would like to see scores be a little bit more drastic. So maybe have the leader at eight and then it goes six, four, or, you know, six, five, four, however they want to do it. A little bit of bigger jump between the bottom guys and the top guys. And then no cut. And then four rounds, no reset. So mm-hmm. then you could have someone, you know, that plays out of their mind that's even par that you know jumps up and then that also yuli takes away your your issue of you guys are just like i'm i'm out of it there's nothing for me to play for because you would still have in that situation two more rounds to potentially move up sure i think the other reason for that rick is like there's not a lot of people out there that final day there's no one out there playing yeah i i think to for your first part of what you were talking about is I think that the the first two days, it really turned into like, hey, who's going to squeak into that 12th spot? And that was the storyline. You know, nobody really yeah. cared who was winning the tournament because it's a reset. It's just you either get in or you don't. And so the the lead card, most of us were just already in. So we we're just kind of cruising through the course, no pressure, no situational awareness. We're just throwing shots, having fun. Uh, and so there was not that much entertainment value if you're a spectator or watching on DGN, it was more so, hey, wh- who's squeaking in that 12th place spot? And that I was think really they showed what, you guys. Right, and I, and I make sense. So I think that that's like what you said. You know, every shot matters if, if what you're saying, if you're not having a cut, cut and you, um, you play all four rounds with, with, uh, with those strokes. Yeah, yeah this it, was weird. Weird. it was weird doing you? like the commentary on the lead card. <laughs> Because it was like, you know, we're, we're having to make it a lot about the course and and what's going to happen, rather and doing a lot of score check ins rather than like the the storylines. Like you said, it had nothing to do with the top four because you guys are obviously getting in, um, and so that was like kind of a difficult difficult thing on on the commentary. And then the second thing, what what you were saying is, um, oh, sorry, what was the second part of your <laughs> question? <laughs> Oh, I was saying I I would, the things I was saying is I would like to see like more scoring separation for the top leaders, no cut, no reset. Those are like the three things I would love to kind of potentially see. Yeah. I think that that would like solve a lot of the problems. Like for you, Yuli, what you're talking about, it would, it would create, oh, and then the spectators. I think that a lot of it was the USDGC. I think that a lot of people actually flew in, had an amazing week at USDGC and then just flew out. So there wasn't as many people able to take off work or whatever it is. So I think that that kind of, uh, you know, made a lot of people not have to choose between weeks. And a lot of people cho- chose USDUC. And I also think I heard that, that there was some VIP passes that were like $800, super expensive, uh, especially for disc golf in the stage that we're at. We're, not, we're still just barely adjusting to, you know, paying to go to watch the tournament it's totally normal for a sports event but for disc golf you still got to look at it as like hey yeah this is still we're still getting to that point where it's it's part of the culture uh and so i think those two things have played a big part it's such a hard it's such a hard thing to think about with like what the 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 decision making that the pro tour and disc golf network and all that stuff has to do because in my head when i'm watching you know coverage I, I think it would make more sense for them to do like five. Don't make it free. Cause I think when you make an event free, that gives people a different kind of concept. Don't make mm-hmm. it free, but like $10 tickets to get on the grounds and have hundreds, thousands of people maybe show up to me. I think that's going to probably be better for disc golf in the long run than these 800 $500 VIP tickets. And then you get crowds where it's like 200, 300 people watching. Right. I mean, like you, I don't use, you, you still have $20 tickets. Like 
you still have those. It's just an option for the VIP to get like the better spots. And all. I do feel like there is a spot for VIP stuff. If you have the budget for that, like for you can sure, still buy a $20 ticket to get on the, on the grounds. I'm pretty sure per day it's like 25 yeah. bucks or something, which is totally reasonable. I, 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 I feel like 25 might be a little high. You're, but... you're right. And that's, yeah. So I was, I was kind of, um, throwing that out there. It wasn't like that was the only ticket option. Yeah. Um, for sure. Uh, what, what is, about, uh, Oh, go ahead. You, you go. No, I was kind of going to go jump into just Ricky, Ricky and, and some career things, but if you have something else on the topic, go ahead, buddy. Oh, I was, I was going to talk about the, the money. And, yeah. and if you saw me and Yuli were talking a little bit before you came on, he saw people like talking about what they were going to do on 18, because of the the situation with placement and money, do do you think that is an impact at this tournament that you see players crack under pressure a little bit more because now you're throwing in one stroke can cost you not just a hundred dollars. We're talking now ten thousand dollars, right? We're talking like serious money for a lot of people. Do you think that comes into play with this tournament? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it just adds just like the pressure of a title. People know that, hey, if I win this title, it comes along with I get bonuses. I get all this different stuff. So as a player, you realize all those things that come along with winning a tournament. And so now the the payout itself is definitely something that people are thinking about. And it's, you know, adds that extra pressure. It's already all the best players are there on such a challenging course that um, everybody's, you know, playing at a high level. And so if you're not, you're – you're getting lapped and you're getting, you know, people are going to jump you, you know, Calvin jumped all the way to the what third. And he was on, you know, he was pretty far back from the podium finish. And, uh, and so he made himself a bunch of extra money by playing solid that last round. Yeah. And, and so, you know, whereas some people, you know, struggled a little bit and, you know, it's hard to get that motivation, but when you got that money on the line, it's, it's, it's a whole different ball game, you know? And I think that's what, you know, Calvin is so good at just, you know, grinding out a great finish and he's done that all year. Yeah. I can't, I, I, I can't wait for purses to continue to go up and up. Cause I think it's just going to add the pressure. I don't think it's going to matter too much to the actual like spectator of like, Oh, they're playing for this and this. I just think the actual drama of the moment is going to be that much bigger for players. And you're, so you're going to see a lot more of these like kind of swings and stuff, if you will. Yeah, and it's going it, to, it's going to be like interesting to see how people, how players develop, with that extra pressure of the money, because right now, like $20,000 is life changing to just a, a regular guy, like number 40 on tour or something. You, you know what I mean? Like if you look at the grand scheme of things, this is a new thing that people have to deal with. Like $40,000 was my best year that I ever played a whole season wrapped up in one tournament. And so it's a, it's a thing that, you know, even I haven't had, I had to experience yet. Like I haven't had a putt that was worth over like 10 grand in my entire life. So I don't know what that feels like. And as these players develop like Gan and even you, Ricky, you know, you've now had two times where you've made the most money that anybody has ever made. And it's just a little bit different. And you have to learn how to like, just like learning how to win. You have to learn what that pressure feels like. It's not something that's just going to come naturally. No, for sure. And it's, it's definitely something that it's a, it's a skill set. It's a, you know, you got to learn how to master that skill set of how do I handle the pressure? What do I do? Well, what is my weakness? What are my tendencies? And, and so those are all things that you have to go back and say, Hey, how, where have I failed in the past? And how do I, how do I change that? How do I, yeah. Like you said, how do I practice to the point where I'm doing my same movements with my form under pressure as I am the first round? And I think you see that a lot of times is someone can pop off and shoot a 12, 13 under, but then by the third or fourth round of the tournament, those pressure nerves, you know, they may come in and turn in a two, three under simply because they're just, their body's not feeling like it did in round one with no pressure. Yeah. Um, but I do think, uh, you know, there is the point where you're as a competitor, you're trying to win. So I don't necessarily think that all of a sudden there's, with all this money, all of a sudden there's going to be that little ex- that extra pressure. There's If you're trying to win and you're at the top and you're in the hunt, there's always those nerves and pressure. Um, and so, like I said, even back when we were playing, if you're trying to win a tournament, you 
you were feeling those pressure and nerves if you're trying to clutch up down the stretch and win. Um, so I think that, you know, the titles are, you know, the, the fact that you can win that title and have that to add to your, you know, legacy as a player, that is it's something that's, I don't think it's going to be like exponentially more, but there is that, you know, 20% more extra pressure because of that payout. Um, we're so, yeah, probably not going to, we probably won't more. see it from the top, the top guys, right? Yeah. We probably won't see it that much from you, Calvin, those, those type of players, Isaac. Um, this is more of like the 20 to 40 range, mm-hmm. right? Those guys, $20,000, $30,000 putt, like they're going to have thoughts on like, man, that could go a whole lot of way. Uh, do I risk it? Right. There's actually risk involved now of like trying to win versus like securing second place or whatever. Um, and we saw it with Bradley Williams earlier at the silver event, he talked about at North Cove about how he was like, he was fine with taking second and not risking like falling super far down the leaderboard. So um, we might, we might see more of that as the uh, purses go up. I want to, uh, we- Go, one go more, qu- I wanted to ask him the question because we were talking about this before you got on, Ricky. Is there a certain amount of money? Because he came up with a scenario where, where, you know, USDGC, last hole, you have a putt from 75 feet, let's say, to tie. But if you miss the putt, you could lose $200,000. Is there any situation where you would ever lay that up? Like tie, what? go to a playoff, or are you running that putt or are you thinking about the 200 grand and are you laying it up? Cause I told him, I don't think there's an amount of money that I could lay a putt up like that for if, if yeah, I could I mean, tie for a, a, you know, a major championship. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that, like you said, that also depends on the player and the, and the person there and the, where they're at in their career. Uh, like you said, if that's that 20th place guy that has have a great weekend and finally got himself in contention, he's going to make some life changing money. They, that player might lay that putt up. Uh, but if you're already established, you've got some titles, you got some money, um, that's a whole different mindset. You know, yeah, it sucks that you're going to, if, 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 if you're looking back, you're like, oh, I lost out on $200,000. But I also gave myself a chance to add a title. As everybody knows, there's no, there's no price you can put on a title at the end of your career. Yeah. So, so I think that like what you said, Brody, that's, that's the biggest thing is where, where a player's at in their career yeah. is going to make that decision swayed one way or another yeah exactly and and we're not even talking about we haven't gotten to the point of where like tour cards are you know that could be a whole nother thing of where it's like hey if i lay up and just secure second place i get my tour card for another year like that could be a whole different other uh, element down the road um all right i want to shift gears a little bit uh announcement came out this week that Dismania now has joined House of Dicks, Dit, House of Dis. Um, pulled a little Terry Miller there. Purpose, Shout out to Terry. Right? No, no, that was not on purpose. Shout out to Terry Miller. Um, but they now join. They, they now join Latitude 64, Dynamic West Side, and Castaplast. So they've got like a little. Uh, they got a little crew going right now. The question I have, Ricky, is: Do you have any? Um, any information on what that looks like on your end now? Does, does, you know, being in this big kind of company that owns all these, does that change anything with your contract? Does, does anything look different? Yeah. So for me as a player, it's really not that much different. A lot of the stuff's on the back end. who's running things, who's making decisions. Uh, the new owner, not owner, but he's a CEO of dynamic this. He, uh, He's worked for Dickies and grown Dickies from, you know, into like back in the early 2000s. <laughs> I noticed you didn't say dynamic discs. You just said dynamic. No. <laughs> I was staying away I was from all that slide. I was saying, now, now you're saying Dickies. Now we're, now we're, now we're going off the rails, man. Yeah, all right, we got to bring it back. Bring it back. Here we go. All, all right. right. Serious, serious, serious. Uh, it's a serious podcast. Yeah. yeah. Um, but anyways, David Hine, he's been he's taken over for Rusko, who is he was basically the CEO before this new David guy who he has a big background of growing Dickies from like twenty million to like five hundred million. So the big corporate stuff. <laughs> um, so <laughs> keep going. <laughs> um, so he's he's kind of taken over a lot, uh, playing a big role. And uh, and a couple of the latitude guys have have taken a step back and let a lot of these uh, 
new people from the house of this make a lot more business decisions <laughs> and <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> i'm sorry i'm sorry Good Good going, you gotta going. stop you gotta stop yeah. laughing please <laughs> So nothing's changing. You're you're good to go. Yeah, everything's I'll... good to go. We're free and clear. Not, as a okay. player, there's nothing changing. <laughs> all right, everything's moving forward. No, every, yeah. all those people that are concerned with Ricky, he's fine. He's gonna be doing yeah. just fine. Yeah. Um. Okay. <sighs> we got we got to get out of that segment, Yuli, as fast as we possibly can. My let God. me go. Let me go. Let me go. Go go. Please take it I, over. I want to talk about Ricky the player for a little bit, which is this is one of the most fascinating stats I've heard. In a very long time with a three stroke lead, you won't have won 16 straight elite series and now okay. 17, 17 straight. I called it when we were, well, a bunch of people called it live and on Jomez, the greatest front ru runner of all time. What is it about being in the lead that makes you so dominant? Well, I think that it's for me, I, for one, I play with a lot of emotion and I feel like that can be good and bad when I'm in contention, I'm on lead card with a chance to win or winning. I, you know, I thrive off of the, you know, making a big shot and using that momentum to spiral me into another birdie, another long putt. And so I just really feed off of that. Like, like I tell people, it's the biggest, you know, thing we closest thing we can come to home field advantage in disc golf is making that big putt, you know, sure. getting all excited and, and having the crowd cheer for you. So I think that's a big part of it and why I succeed. And I, you know, I, I thrive under those situations oh, no. both ways. Cause if I'm, you know, if I'm not in contention, of course I'm a competitor. I want to try to try to get back in contention, but I don't have those, those cheers. I don't have the, the eruption of the crowd for that six shot that can then parlay into another one and another one. Sure. Um, so that's a huge, um, huge thing for me. And I think that's why I, I feel like that stat is, you know, reflects that. Yeah. That's yeah. the craziest stat ever, dude. That and, is, I, uh, and I never even realized tough. that the, the stat, yeah. I just, you, I just kind of always known that I've, I've been an emotional player and I, you know, I, I I'm, I wear the emotions on my sleeve when I make a, and I think the other thing is I can sense a big turning point in a tournament uh, when, yeah. when you need to make that shot. And, and, and I think that's important. Obviously you could say every shot in the final round is important, but there's always those handful of shots in a round, whether it's a putt or an up shot to keep that momentum of that round going to save the par yeah. or a sick drive. Um, so there really, you could really pick out two or three moments and it could even be on like hole one, that big putt sparked me. Um, and so the, that's, that helped a lot. And then 16, that, that putt was so unbelievable. Big. Yeah, it was one stroke to, to, you know, Kyle birdied that hole. So I was still stayed up two. so going up two, you know, staying up two, going into 17 and 18 with all the out of bounds and all the, the variants, I knew yeah. that that was a huge putt. If you put a percentage on it, it would be go from like 60% to like a 90% chance to win. Um, just because, yeah, you know how tournaments play out. You know how the last two holes can go. And so having that extra stroke is absolutely massive. And so I could, I felt that. And that's what I, when I just let it out. What? Yeah, the, what the, is that? The way that I was going to say real quick, the way that 18 was playing, that did not look like a hole that you wanted to have to make a birdie on down the yeah, stretch. It's, no, it's, it's a tough hole and, and you have to take on so much aggression. Like what you were saying, Kyle could have very easily, he got up and down for the bogey after his first shot went out of bounds. But I mean, that could, he could have thrown a couple more out of bounds. And then all of a sudden Calvin posted a nine under could have caught you or something. Obviously that's not how it played out. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that hole is, has a lot going on with the out of bounds and, and it's, it just makes you think, and and it's a lot of people were taking big numbers on it. I know in the FPO, people took some big numbers. Weezy took a nine, I think, to miss the finals by one. Right, mm -hmm. and so it just, yeah, it, it's it's tricky. It can get what, you. What is the difference then? Like, walk us through the feelings of okay, so you obviously have momentum when you have the lead, but does it affect you when you don't necessarily have a chance for the win? Is it tougher to get that momentum and to, um, you know, post a really good round? 
Yeah, it's harder. It's a little harder to get that spark. And I think that you can compare it to a round. Let's say you come out with a, a round, um, just it doesn't have to be necessarily a certain time in the tournament, but you come out and you get a par, 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 first three holes you par, and you're trying to birdie those holes. Well, on hole four, you know, you, you throw a bad shot or something, and you throw some crazy throw in to get that momentum and spark to you. And so for me, when I'm playing bad, I really look for that shot. And it may not necessarily be the flashiest shot, or but it's just it's something that you're really proud of that shot, and you can really build off of that for the for the future for the rest of the round. And so I always tell it to people: is take those little wins when you're not playing great, and really let that snowball in a positive way. And so for me, that's kind of what I try to do when I'm not having the crowd erupt. Is like take that take that 30 foot straddle putt that you've got your first birdie, like sweet, like. That's awesome. I get it. You didn't win the tournament with that putt, but that changed the momentum of how you, how your outlook of the round. I finally got over that hump of I've got the birdie, yeah. and then I can play a little bit more confident after that. Yeah. All right. We're going to let you go. Enjoy. It looks like it's a, a wonderful day in Arizona there in that backyard. Some nice little trees you got there. Nice little pool. Um, so we do appreciate you taking the time real quick though. If you want to, uh, kind of let people know about your Saki bomb foundation. I think you guys are doing some great things over there. If you want to let people know how they can kind of support that and help that. Yeah. So we got the, the website, the Saki bomb foundation.org. And this year, uh, keep it short and sweet. We're, we're giving away 50 discs in a basket to 50 different schools in 50 different States. So wow. we try to pick a uh, school in a different state and we donated a package. I went to uh, a couple, I think I went to one in Vermont, and I went to a couple others and did like a clinic there. So that's the first initiative. And that's been really cool, really to see everyone sending their posts and videos of the kids throwing their first putt. Uh, it's kind of a catch on words because a lot of times it's the kids first putt at, at recess or gym class or whatever. So that was, uh, I'm very proud of that. Uh, and then we're doing a pro-am here in Phoenix. Uh, so we're gonna be doing a fundraiser here. A uh, good time of year to, to get everyone out, nice weather and uh, donate some money. So or raise some money. But um, yeah, we're going to be posting more about that in the next month or so. So be on the awesome. top of that. That's great, man. That's awesome to hear. And uh, yeah, like I said, congratulations, man, on another back-to-back -to -back tour championship. And uh, thanks for stopping by, man. We appreciate it. Have a great off season, man. I will. Thank you. You too, Brody. And uh, we'll see you guys soon. All right. Take it easy. All see right. Ricky Wysocki, ladies and gentlemen. Woo. All right. We got, we're, we got to move past that. We got to move past that. We got to get, Hey, we got to get super we're past serious. It. We're here. Past it. You, we got to get, we got to get super professional. Okay. We're Cause serious. we're bringing, I've we're bringing more. on one of the most professional men in disc golf. This is the, mm -hmm. I believe I, I keep saying on course reporter. Cause all I keep saying is like, Terry, I hear Terry, Brian, Brian, can you, can you tell us what's going on? Brian, 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 what's going We have Brian Earhart with us. First time on tour life, man. Hey, thanks for stopping by, man. Nice to, nice to be here, man. Thanks for having me. How's the, how's it going? Where, where are you at right now? I have moved to Charlotte. Um, I oh. actually close on my first house next Thursday and, uh, we move in then. So we're just oh, in the RV. Yeah. I'm at an uh, Airbnb right now that some of the operations guys for the tour are checking out of tomorrow. So yeah, life's good. I'm home already. Dude, congrats. Yeah. Congrats on the house. Congrats on the engagement. Lots of things are going yeah. good in there. <laughs> That's awesome, yeah. man. Thank uh, you. You're gonna ho hopefully it's not too overwhelming with all the all the stuff coming up, all the planning and and all that. So that's the fun part, anyways. Of course, um, I mean, it's it's fun. I want to jump into it right away. Uh, we've had we've had um, Jeff Spring on where I've been able to ask him some questions about the Disc Golf Network, mm -hmm. but I feel like you're like in it. You really are, you know, seeing exactly what's going on. My first question is. It feels to me like the way that they do commentary is backwards. Okay. Do you do you think the way that disc golf does commentary is correct, or do you do you side with me being backwards? I'd love to know what your definition of backwards is. Maybe that'll help jog okay. my my thought process. So so my thought is 
you have the people in the booth that aren't on the ground, right? They, they're they only able to see what they can see with the mm-hmm. cameras. They should set up the shot as far as, okay, we're going to hole four. Ricky mm-hmm. Wysocki is currently three under par. He's throwing his second shot. Mm-hmm. Brian, what can you tell us? And mm-hmm. then they go straight to you, and you walk us through everything leading up to the shot. Mm-hmm. You walk us through the shot, and you walk us through the result. Mm-hmm. And then the booth – you have like a Philo or a Nate Doss, someone mm-hmm. like that. They then give their, you know, perspective on it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. That to me seems like it versus it seems like it's backwards where the booth is trying to tell you everything. And then at the end, they're like, Brian, is that in bounds? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then yeah. they cut to you yeah. and you're like, bro, I don't know. I'm standing by the guy that threw the disc. It's 400 mm-hmm. feet, away, you know? That's what I mean by backwards. I see what you're saying. Don't don't they do a little bit of that in golf? Don't they have like That's Faraday? exactly how they yeah, do it? They yeah, they have like Faraday and the other guy like do a lot of that kind of stuff. I really I think, don't come up with any original ideas. I just take it from stuff that's already been done successfully. That's all. Well, that's my trick. Well, I, I'm not saying it has to be an original idea. I think if golf's done it for this long, that there's probably something that's working for it. And mm-hmm. Faraday and those guys have been doing it for forever. Um, I think we've talked about something like this in the future. I think just the role of the on course guy is just con- like continuously evolving. Um, I think the big thing for me, like you just said, I even if I'm down the fairway and they throw it to me and say, hey, did you see that? Sometimes the courses are shaped really weird to where I might be on one side of the fairway. Someone goes into an, on the other side of the fairway. I can't run across the fairway while someone's walking up to T to tell someone where that is. It's, it's a process of, of me communicating with them beforehand too. So I have a message thread going with Terry or whoever's in play by play saying like, Hey, I'm on the T now. Don't throw until after T shots. Hey, I'm down the fairway, but I'm on the left side or I'm down by the OB. Um, and that is evolving. But I think what golf is doing, you know, so they sometimes have two on course guys, don't they? I mean, they have a lot. They, yeah. they, they basically have, they have them throughout the entire course essentially so that yeah. they can kind of throw it to people all over the place. But I don't think they have it two on one card. I don't think they're ever going to have two no. people following one card. But, but, but what I'm saying is like, that's a thing already. And we've already, I, I believe talked about that being more of a thing in the future. So we don't get into these awkward scenarios where it's like, no, <laughs> I don't, I don't know where that yeah. went. Uh, I have probably a worse perspective than you sometimes. So, um, yeah, I'd like to do more calling from the ground. The big problem is it can only be done with one card because so much of the rest of the broadcast is in replay and I'm only seeing four players. So if we have multiple people on the ground, maybe someone with Chase to set up shots there, that would be a possibility. So I, I agree with you and I think it could be evolved. Um, it's just a matter of time. Yeah, it just seems like you could give so much mm-hmm. to the commentary side when I'm watching because I was watching this past tournament and there was, so, I've played this course and there was times where I was like, I do not know what, like, what is he trying to do right now? Mm-hmm. And it'd be so nice to have someone, you know, you 30 feet away with your, you know, have your little binder or whatever. And then mm-hmm. you're, you know, holding it, covering your mouth being like, yeah, I yeah. got this really tight. Cause yeah. sometimes too, the camera angle also is is on the fairway shooting, not in the direction that they're throwing. Yeah. And so you, you, you just see him throw it through trees and you don't realize like he just hit a gap. That's four feet wide. Yeah. Right? Like he's hit a really tiny gap mm-hmm. and we don't really get to see that at all. So the, I would the, love to see you just get more involved about like what's going on with the I shot agree. specifically. I agree. And I think, I think this off season, that role itself is going to get uh, flushed out quite a bit more. I, I think we have love quite that. a few changes happening with the broadcast because we're, we're kind of seeing these little weaknesses, like, you know, you being a viewer and a player, um, you're seeing these as well. I think uh, the other thing that is tough is when you're play by play, sometimes our broadcasts go in rapid fire mode, where if you try to throw it to me when they're set up to be set up, sometimes producer goes, no, we, we, we just caught something on chase card. We're throwing it to chase card. And then you look like an idiot as the play-by-play guy trying to set something up that's not even on screen anymore. So I don't know if this is a problem for other sports, but we're still working through like 
production wise i guess maybe terry or charlie they're trying to figure out wh when do i have space to even throw something like that so producers in your ear trying to tell you hey you have room to do this you're messaging them back and forth like hey can i can i get time to set this up um i wish it flowed more smoothly um and i yeah. don't know what the right answer is like is it just something that we should be better at and we should just practice or is there a, a method change um, it's really complicated, but I think we've done a good job so far. I think Encore Sky can definitely get flushed out more. It's so, about, it's so, yeah, go ahead, Yuli. What about like uh, the way that it's filmed, the way that disc golf is filmed right now, being in the studio and getting seen, getting to see all the shots. Mm -hmm. um, Brody and I have talked about this a lot. Like my thing with, with it is I feel like we switch and, and I think Brody agrees. I might've got this from Brody actually. I think that they switch to the catch cam way too soon. Like, and you don't get a full perspective of exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. Um, what tree it hits, if it slides up, like the flight of a disc is so beautiful. And I feel mm -hmm. like the most captivating thing that we have to show the world yet, we show half the flight and then we're at the catch cam and then here comes a disc in and there's no perspective of how long it was, what the flight was, how it's landing, the angle control that that player displayed. I, I agree. Since you're in, since you're in the booth and you're mm -hmm. in the network, and I think you need to put in a word and be like, "Hey, we need to <laughs> we we need to maybe ca catch those the first the whole flight of the shot would be fantastic." And then if it gets a weird ground play or something, switch to that, and then you mm -hmm. can explain how this landed or whatever. I feel like it'd give more talking points. I agree. Um, <laughs> You, you watched Marty McFly back in the old YouTube days, right? When he yeah. didn't even have commentary. They had so much of that. So much of just shot behind the player and you'd watch the entire line flip up. I learned so much about players' play styles just watching from that camera angle. So if I'm being so selfish and, and I don't know anything about the broadcast, I want almost entirely the shot to be sh shot from behind yeah. the player. My speculation is that some, I mean, obviously we're shooting from live view units and sometimes the, the shot just loses quality, like picture quality halfway through. Sure. And then the producer goes, uh, eh, throw to catch cam. Maybe they have better quality. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I personally wish we saw more of that, but I, I don't know the full factors that cause them to switch. It might just be personal preference, but I'll, I'll write something for the suggestion box for you. Uh, Yuli. I'll throw it in another, there. <laughs> another thing that I feel like we miss is, that I don't think anybody really thinks about is angle control with the cameras. Like some angles of putts look like they're 20 feet, but it's actually a 45 footer. Perspective, and I think yeah. that, and I think that like, if we could train the cameramen to understand what angles they need to get, and it might be tough to get them in that position just because of where, where the player is. Mm -hmm. But if that's the case, the players should be able to deal with a cameraman being in an awkward position as long as he's mm -hmm. being still and he's just part of the course at this point and part of like yeah. the game. But like seeing multiple times, like even this last week mm -hmm. of uh, Ricky making this long putt, I couldn't tell if he was 40 feet or 20 feet. And mm -hmm. we have the circles that really help. It mm -hmm. really helps give you perspective, but it also makes the putt look so easy to where there are other angles that make the putt even look farther, which I think on a marketing standpoint, we should always get that angle as far as making that putt look as most difficult as it possibly can, because we all know how, how hard it actually is. Well, how, uh, what angle is that from your perspective? I think can it's I, diagonal can... back. Mm. What I was going to say is I think I think they need to have a – this is where I'm talking about like the setup shot. They yeah. need to have a shot that is uh, perpendicular with the putt. So it shows specifically like, holy cow, like that's super far away. You don't show that as mm -hmm. he's putting, but that's like the setup shot that, Brian, you're now saying like, yep, he's about 60 feet. Uh, yeah. This is a – it slopes right to left. He's got – and then when he's about to putt – then you cut it to right behind and yeah. then you actually have the best angle of seeing the putt of whether or not, because I also think the diagonal putt, the diagonal angle you, you just said, I don't get any suspense of whether like, I'm just kind of waiting for it to go in or not where yeah. if uh, whoever filmed the putt of Ricky on 16, because he was mm -hmm. right behind Ricky and where the oh, basket was, 
I can see it. And I'm like, oh my God, is that turning in? It's turning in. It's turning. Like I can, if that was off to his left, yeah. I wouldn't be able to see that at all. And I'm just kind of sitting there that, waiting. As, like, that's the angle that I'm talking about is mm-hmm. diagonal behind. Oh, okay. So, so not super diagonal, see. just a little. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. then so, we switched really quick to the catch cam. <laughs> yeah yeah no there are like i don't know if i'm supposed to share this but i feel like it's totally harmless it. i think it's i think well i think it's necessary like in any sort of media world there are pictures of like still frames in the media trailer saying like these are optimal oh, angles okay. yeah no oh, they, gotcha. are, they yeah. already have that i again my speculation is it's probably really hard <laughs> and i'm, oh, I'm guessing yeah. to get into certain positions i'm guessing it's it's difficult but f- i know for a fact there's training booklets and training manuals made for this from guys that have worked in in pro sports before that have you know that already lead our our broadcast so um if someone misses that i don't know if it's a you know experimental angle or they're trying to get something more artful but i agree with you in that sometimes someone lets go of a putt and you're like that looks like 10 feet and they're actually yeah. at 35 and it's like, yeah. whoa, that's strange perspective for sure. And one thing that I don't think we always think about is there's four players. It's sometimes hard for like, as a player to get out of the way to think yeah. about now, like video people having to, okay, this guy's putting. And then all of a sudden this guy's putting, you don't even have time to get in position there. Yes. So I think that's, a, True. it's a weird one because at it's, Going to two sums would solve this problem. But when you go to two sums, we now have way less people we can watch. So it's like, uh, True. that's that it's, it, there isn't an easy answer. Um, yeah. I want to shift a little bit here. I want to talk about what you think, you know, being a part of the disc golf network and producing content also on the disc golf network as well. What do you think about the paywall? Do you, do you like the way that disc golf is headed right Mm. now of where we are putting, you know, round one for free. And then if you want to watch the rest, we're behind the paywall. Do you, do you think that is the, are we a pay-per-view sport moving Mm. forward? I think that's uh, a catch 22 because we need the subscriber money to put out the product that we're putting out. Um, And I've, but at the same time, if you get on, like we just signed this deal with CBS, what happens when we get on cable? Do we lose all those subscribers? You know, like what, where do we go if CBS really, really likes what we're doing? Um, So do I like where we are? I love it. I I think it's necessary right now, um, at least from my perspective. Um, But in the future, yeah, who knows? I mean, it'd be amazing for us to get in a place where, we could have big enough ad, ad revenue, you know, for people to be able to watch it for free. But I think right now we're just still a very small business compared to yeah. a lot of other sports. I think yeah. you might've mentioned it or Yuli might've mentioned it. Some guy posted on Reddit, like he worked in like college sports and posted like the budget for like a college football game or something. And you're yeah. like, Oh my God, that is so much bigger than we get to spend. And I, we went to like a, some national broadcasting convention and blew the minds of the people who, work with the technology we work with. They're like, you guys are stretching our technology well beyond like what we oh, even could awesome. fathom. The Red Bull guys who like, you know, deal with break dancing and all those other cool extreme sports were like apparently hobnobbing with like our guys. And they were like, dude, you guys are doing stuff that we can't even fathom. They're asking us questions. So apparently, and I don't know this stuff, apparently we're doing a pretty good job with the little budget yes. that we have. So right now it feels like the community still is in a grassroots place where, yes, we are going to have to support what's going on, but I hope we can get to a place where some company goes, wow, this is sick. This is super cool. Let's try to bring this to the next level. And I'm guessing, you know, maybe making it cheaper or more accessible in some way for the rest of the world to see. That's at least, you know, from my limited perspective, what I think. Yeah, I was I was looking at the numbers. If you watch on uh, the Disc Golf Network on desktop, it actually has the live numbers of how many people are mm-hmm. watching. And so I think the numbers are right around. I, I watched MPO on round three, and then I watched FPO final round, and I don't think either one ever eclipsed over 3,000. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, man, there are so many people that play disc golf. There are so many people that watch Joe mm-hmm. Mez. There are so many people that are consuming. Yeah. Co- I mean, watch this podcast, right? Yeah. I mean, we some of our episodes get 50,000 uh, listens, right? And so it's like, 
how do we get more people watching live coverage? But I, I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, it's such a touch. It's, it's such a tough, I understand. tough situation. Um, but I appreciate you giving more intel on that behind the, behind the curtain a little bit. That's um, just what it, it feels refreshing. like at least. And it is refreshing to hear that we're doing a lot with a little, I mean, that's something yeah. that, you know, is a, uh, is a good thing to hear especially for our listeners to, because we have a lot of people with their opinions of disc golf network. And we talk about it from time to time mm-hmm. on, on the podcast. So knowing that even with what we have, like, you know, we're doing the best job that we possibly can is very, sounds like it. Yeah. Sounds like, and it's funny because I, you, you guys ever read that book. If you give a mouse a cookie, when you were a little kid, do you remember that book, Yuli? I feel no. like you no. read that to sleep every day. It, it's pretty much just like if you, if you give a mouse, to go to sleep. The, the book essentially is like if you give a mouse a cookie, it's going to ask for milk, and if it gets milk, it's going to ask for this, and if it gets this, it's going to ask for this. It feels like sometimes, and and maybe the evolution of anything, they get the cookie, they get the milk, and they're like, well, what the heck? This milk and cookies stink. What about this? And I feel like you know. And Yuli, you know, me and you've been playing since the Disc Golf Planet days when they were trying to grind out live coverage. Like, we've come so far, and I think finally we're, like, hitting a wall of, like, oh, wow, we have to deal with some big business problems now. And Disc Golf used to only be grassroots. So um, I feel like we're traversing that weird, like, awkward middle ground of, like, are we still grassroots? Are we a professional sport? I feel like we're kind of right in between. And some people think we're here. Some people think we're here. Um, so I think we're just kind of having to deal with some weird growing pains. And I think that business side is, is definitely the big hurdle right now. Yeah. And if you watch any other coverage from sports similar to disc golf, and what I mean by that is ones that aren't, here's the event it's right here, right? Football, baseball, basketball, Mm -hmm. hockey, where it's just, this is the event. They've got tons of can't, they, if you watch golf, I mean, golf is a perfect example. They have millions upon millions more money than disc golf. Their coverage is far more extensive. Mm -hmm. I listen to a golf podcast every week. You know, what's on that podcast every week, them complaining about the broadcast. Yeah. 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 It's, it's just the nature of the beast. It's It's the nature of sports. Yes. You're going to, you're going to have no matter how good your commentary is, right. No matter how good you are, (laughs) there are going to be people that hate it. It's just, yeah. It just always is, but we always should be trying to improve and and try to get better and better. It sounds like that's what uh, the Disc Golf Network is doing, and um, that is good to hear. Yeah. Um, all right, before we let you go here, you're a busy man. I've been talking to yeah. you about a lot of the projects you've been doing. Uh, do you want to share kind of what projects people can either tune in right now that is mm-hmm. out there for them con- to consume or stuff that's coming down the pipeline? Sure, man. Yeah, thank you. Um, So yeah, the tour has kind of brought me on as a commentator and also a producer. So I I shot two seasons of shows this year. Um, One of them was a passion project, which I told you about Brody, I know for a fact, um, called Catch. And it was like my my desire to just get away from the stress and drama of golf and just like play Frisbee again. And um, I turned it into kind of like an interview show. And the six episodes that we shot for the pilot have been just delightful and uh, got a bunch of really cool players on Gannon, Juliana Corver, germ. Um, and each episode turned out completely different. Kind of like when you play catch with somebody. So I think the format is good when you give someone something in their hands to, to hold, it's funny what comes out of their mouth. So uh, that was like my passion project that came to life. That's going to be on Jomez and DGN this off season. And then I shot 12 more episodes of level up, which is an instructional series I did with Discraft last year. We did season two this year. Um, and that's coming out on the disc golf pro tour, YouTube channel, I believe, um, nice. but still sponsored by Discraft, but it's going to go, it's kind of like a partnership with them. And, uh, yeah, it's probably the final season of, of instructional stuff that I'll do. Yuli probably can attest. It's really hard to keep coming up with instructional topics that aren't watered down so i feel pretty proud of the 24 that i did um and then yeah we did an interview with ken climo i know you guys did one earlier in the year they wanted me to do one in the style of my podcast that i used to have and you know you guys know he's a great guy and it was a great conversation and uh we talked a lot about just frisbee in general and he told a lot of cool stories and that's also going to go on the disc golf network this off season so a lot of cool stuff in the pipeline but i'm super excited for next year that's awesome I do want to say too, we're, we're not doing it in the off season, but we're going to bring it back 
we would love to have you on debate night. I think okay. uh, having you on would be great to kind of get a, a different perspective on some of the topics that yeah. we, we talk about. So I'll, I'll have to have uh, Trevor reach out to you and whatnot cool. and try to get you on that show. Um, you you want to hit him? Well, actually, I, I do want to know about your pet peeves. Uh, I, okay. I do, actually. Before we go to Yuli's final question, what pet peeves do you have? Because I think they might be a little bit different than some of us. Okay. So number one, I have like a... I knew you were going to ask me this. So I was told by fans of your show that I had to get ready for this. So um, number one is a softer one. Paul and I had a really funny case of this. Like last year we were in Charlotte and we let a solo player play through and he threw multiples. He threw like four drives off the tee when we let him play through. And I, my jaw dropped and I looked over at Paul like, what? Who? And he played out like two of the shots too. Like, if you're playing through somebody, you get you get through the hole and you get to the next tee and you leave them in, in your dust. That's my big pet peeve. I've seen <laughs> it happen too many times. And then one that's a little bit more I hate to call it controversial because it's just it's just an opinion I have. Um, I feel like range finders should be used in practice only. Um, mm. I really love depth perception as a skill in, in disc golf. I think it's really cool to challenge players to get as close as they can to OB or close as they can to a tree line and not know the distance. I think that's a really cool skill and you can do your course prep and you can write the distances of trees and whatnot. But I love when it's tournament time that you have to trust intuition. So that's, that's like my more competition related pet peeve is I, I hate seeing people range find every single shot. I don't hate them. They're just trying to play to win, but I, I love that element of our game, and I wish it came back in a more natural way. That will be the first topic. If you do come on debate night, that will be the first topic. Sick. That That's, is a I'm, good I'm one down. right there. Hey, I'm going to text I'm a, I'm uh, range, right now. I'm a range finder guy, but I completely agree. I think in the future, and I'm probably going to get fired from Bush now for, <laughs> for this, but uh, I think it is a skill, and I think – as the sport progresses in the next 10 years, you're going to see good caddies who do that work, mm -hmm. which I'm lucky enough to have Brad and he does it on the course um, while I play, but to have your caddy go and do that prep work for you while mm -hmm. you practice or whatever, and be able to write that stuff down. Um, there's a reason why, you know, in traditional golf, they have those yeah. guys who have the exact numbers and everything in it and who can help the player. And I'd like to see the sport get that to there. But before I ask you my question, <clears throat> okay. Brian, you are a fantastic commentator. Uh, your shows you, are buddy. awesome. The work that you put on um, your on course uh, perspective is great. And uh, I just want you to know how much I appreciate a uh, professional voice like that. It's very refreshing. Not that the other guys aren't, but um, I think you're really great at what you do in Thank your playing you, days. Yeah. In your playing days, who was the player that you looked at and you, and it doesn't matter what skill set they had. You were a little jealous of, or you were like, "Man, I wish I had that." Or, "Man, that's mm. really nice." Throw throw a skill set that somebody had. Out when there I first me. when I first met Conrad, like James Conrad, I was so jealous of the way he threw just the really stock putter shots. And, because you know, when I first came on the tour, I was like this weird, like lefty big germ with like way overly technical you know, forehand as my stock shot. And I just made the game way too hard on myself. Like I was good on certain courses cause I, I could get away with that style. But over time, it's just like, I wish I could just throw a putter like James did. You know, I felt like I was okay at it, but I couldn't do it when it mattered. And that's a shot that now that's all I care about throwing. But back when I was competing, I was like, dang, Conrad just does that over and over and over again. It's so yeah. easy. And I, it felt like I skipped like a part of the game. You know, when I was a kid, yeah. I found the sidearm and I started getting good at the sidearm and I started doing well in AM tournaments. And I just kind of leaned on that strength until I became pro. Um, so I, I, I don't envy the players that come into tour with like more sidearm dominant than, than backhand because that's the fundamentals and that's the easiest shot. Good answer. Dang. All right. Well, I know everyone really enjoyed listening to you and uh, we definitely want to hopefully have you come back at some point, um, d dive into sure. some other topics as well. And uh, I know we all appreciate what you do. And again, if any of the disc golf <laughs> network producers or anyone is listening, get this man more involved on the mic during coverage. <laughs> I want to hear more of Brian. Thank you. Um, but yeah, appreciate we appreciate that, it, man.
Thank you, man. You guys rock. And Paul, I got to just give you a shout out, man, because I remember meeting you at Big Germ's. It was Henry's house, but Big Germ's house when we first met. And we had that long conversation about the Banger GT out in the backyard. And, you know, that conversation led to you wanting me to teach clinics with you the next season. And and that was that's where things took off for me, because someone actually listened to what I had to say. So I. I can't ever say that I'm self-made in this sport at all because people like you and Germ and like people that just said, Hey, I, I I think what this guy has to say is cool and unique and and you actually cared about it. So I appreciate you guys so much for even giving me a voice when I was, I was nobody, you know, I just loved the game and I wanted to share what I knew with people and you, you finally listened. So I appreciate that, buddy. Yeah, man. Much love my brother. Good night guys. Have have a wonderful night and uh, good luck with all the new house stuff. All right. Thank you so much. I'll see you guys. All right. Take care. All right. Brian Earnhardt, ladies and gentlemen, man, we got to get him back on the pod, dude. I already already have a bunch of, he's so good on a mic, man. He really is. So good. You can just talk to him forever. My goodness. You Mm -hmm. know who else you can talk to forever? Our next guest, ladies and gentlemen, coming in the man himself, Calvin. What's up, brother? Nothing much. How are y'all doing? Are you in, uh, are you in Florida? You back yeah, home? I, uh, I just got home uh, yesterday evening, and um, today I've just been, you know, unpacking the car and uh, doing laundry and stuff. So nothing too exciting, but I am I'm finally home. What's the uh, temp like down there right now? Um, today was Perfect pretty nice. Guy. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly what it was, but it was probably in in the 70s somewhere today. Ooh. That's nice. Yeah. It's, it's freaking, I don't know why it's so hot here, but it's, it's very hot right now in Vegas. Um, did not, I was not expecting it to be as hot as it was down here. Um, but, uh, shall we jump into it? Cause this is the topic everyone's talking about. I'm sure you've seen, well, I don't know. You, you're not on Twitter yet. First off, let's talk. Let's start there. What do we need to do to get this man on Twitter? Tell the people right now, Calvin, what needs to happen for you to create a Twitter account? Um, I don't, I don't think the people need to do anything. I just have to, uh, find the motivation myself to, to be willing to, but what if the people gave you that motivation? That's what I'm saying. What if they ate, what if they're able to drive you to do it? I, I don't know if they can. I think I have to make the choice myself. <laughs> that sounds like a challenge, Julie. That sounds like he's challenging the people. Mm-hmm. I bet, I bet they'll Blow come him up, up on something. messenger. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Make it, make it happen. People figure it out. Um, all right. Topic topic. That's been flying around everywhere. All of social media, the player of the year situation. Everyone's talking about it. Um, I first, before we get into it, I first want to know how important is that award to you? Is that something that you are thinking about throughout the season? Um, I don't, I don't think it was something I was thinking about throughout the season. Uh, it was definitely something I was thinking a little bit about coming down the end of the stretch, but you know, as a whole, you, you kind of have to look at every event as its own little thing. I mean, the bigger picture, you know, however that plays out, it plays out. But, um, I, I, I don't, in the past, I would say I wouldn't have cared at all, but I do, I do have some incentives locked in on my current deal to where, you know, it would be nice to win. But I mean, at this point, you know, I've done what I've done and I'm not, I'm not actually completely sure how, how they're all decided. I know the PDJ has a point system pro tour. I, I think don't it's know. vote. I think it's vote. I think it's media gotcha. and I think it's a media vote with players as well. It's pro tour that I think the PDJ does have a point system. Yeah. So uh, I don't even, I don't even know wait, which, which one, one which more. one do we care about? Which one do you care about? Both, if Which he one? has incentives for him. <laughs> well, oh, is it, is it for either? Is it is your incentive for either one, or is it specifically for one of those? Um, I'd have to go check on how it's written, but I think it's either. Oh, okay. Wow. Oh, nice. All right. Um, all right. So I'm gonna throw this graphic up first. We're gonna we're gonna take a peek at this graphic because Calvin, I am on your side. You have to convince this man next to me because he is not on your side. He he is an enemy. I am on team Calvin. He is not looking at this graphic. Why this, would you put, paint that picture? <laughs> what do you mean paint? That's, that's <laughs> what it is. You literally said he shouldn't be wow. playing here. What do you want me to say? He can go back and watch the tapes. Um, 
we have this uh, post from Foundation. Who would win player of the year? You got player A, three elite wins, two silver wins, 72,000 earned, eight podiums. Player B, two elite wins, one silver win, 93K earned, 13 podiums. Player C, two major wins, 13 top tens, 92K, eight podiums. Um, I want to put a little asterisk before we, we, we get Yuli's answer here. I want to put a little asterisk. I thought it was very interesting that whoever made this graphic, I don't know who it was. They decided to, for player C, put 13 top tens, but decided not to put 22 top tens for player B. I thought that was a very interesting move that they didn't do that. So uh, Yuli looking at that, who are you picking as your player of the year? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a player myself, so I'm player biased. Um, when I look at those, there's an obvious one that I would, I would trade. I would trade none of the others for the two majors as a player. I would take that over the other two for sure. But is that the question though? The question isn't what season would you rather have? The question is who had a better season? I think those two things are very different. Do you, Calvin, yeah, do you I, agree with me that those two, because I, I think are, you would, tr- I think you would trade different. player of the year for two majors, right? For sure. But I, I don't think they're necessarily the same because like I could look yes. back in the past 10 years and if I, I, if I could trade seasons, I would always trade with whoever won worlds because that right. it is a major, but it has way more value to us than any other major. So yeah. Like if you're just looking at like what season would I trade for, I'm I'm always going to choose whoever won Worlds. So that's not necessarily the the only thing to look at. Because um, I think yeah, you but, have to do like the you have to do but, the crazy theoretical of like you you hey, win two majors and you miss cash at every single event, right? I think all of us are picking that person season right like to have but they, yeah. they, they don't necessarily have the best season. Bring up the, the profile again. Do you want, which one do you want this one? Or do you uh, yeah. Sa, show, show, one, show him the other one. one. Show, wait, show him the other one real quick. Cause uh, he might want to see these numbers. This is how crazy Calvin people are getting with this. Someone put the, I don't, I don't even want to know. I can't, see, know. It. I can't <laughs> see that. Bring see the other that. one back up. I don't even want to know what this person was doing, but that was an impressive I, number work by that person. Shout out to whoever that was. I think it obviously is between player A and player C for me. I think player B out of the equation as far as player of the year. Um, I think player yeah, B, I since I know it's me, I think like <laughs> the, I mean, issue, I, I, sorry, the, I gotta, the issue, I gotta, the issue you have on this graphic <laughs> is like the thing that actually puts me in contention is the fact that, I finished outside the top 10 once. Yeah, never. <laughs> like, you, I finished here, outside the top enough. 10 once, and then outside the top five, maybe three total times. We're 2 v so, like, you, Yuli. We're 2 v one you. Does this change your mind at all? Calvin's worst finish is player C's average finish. Yes. Yeah, that changes my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean if, I, if it was, was based player just C's on, average, yeah, if it was based just on this graphic that we're showing right here, I mean, every single person is going to choose player C. Mm-hmm. If, if, like, if that's what I'm, if I'm only basing it on money earned there, and then the two major wins, and that's that's what we're basing it off of, like just this graphic, like it's not even a contest, like. Every yeah. single person would choose player C. And then, and just in general, I think anyone, if you're talking about which season you'd rather have, it's like, it's always going to be whoever won world. So, right. Well, what about this? What about player, player B get second at all the majors. Okay. And never finishes out of the top 10, but player B wins three majors and only gets like five top tens, which one is a better player? You know, like there's an average finish of the guy. Like at what point do we put precedence on winning big tournaments? Because let's be honest, you're at a level 
that like myself have never, I've never been at, like, I've never been at a level to where I'm winning all of these tournaments. So I don't even know what it feels like, but as an outside perspective, which player is, is the better player and which season is the better season? Like a person I mean, who takes I, so, second. So I guess the question is, if it's only based on majors, why do we play the other events? Should this only Good be point. an average major yeah. finish? Like if that's, if that's the argument, then we should remove all elite series wins, all silver series. And we only base it on who plays the best at the majors. Well, and even to one up that if wins are the only thing that matters, then that should be the only stat that we look at. We shouldn't look at top fives or top tens, right? Or money or all that stuff. Yeah. yeah, I I think the fascinating thing with this, and I guess I was wrong. Uh, I thought there was only one player of the year. I guess there's two. So I think you, I think, so we're saying the PDJ one is some sort of algorithm that they're going to run through uh, something. Is that what we're thinking? Yeah. I, it's some kind of points thing. Um, I okay. think they update it like weekly, but. They probably um, paid someone a million dollars to get the formula for it. So it's, I'm sure yeah. it's going to be really, really hey, good. I, um, I think I get what you guys are saying. If I were to say, right now who is the best player on the planet if i didn't pick calvin it would be silly because of your consistency throughout the entire season and i think that other players that are playing against you who are even in this race are going to pick you i mean even having like ricky on on the show earlier he had high praise for your season you know what i'm saying he's he was he was saying how impressive it was that like you still scrapped out a third place finish at the pro championships, even though you didn't need to have to necessarily have a great final round, but you did because that's what you've been doing all season. U S championships, final round coming back. Um, And so without a doubt, I think you are the best player on the planet. And I don't think there's an argument to be had for that. Is that the same as player of the year? That's, that's the question. But if you want, if you want, if you want player of the year to just be based on which season you want the most, it's always going to be based on who wins worlds. So you're, you're awarding the same award for world title and player of the year. I I agree. I think you guys are, I think you you guys are changing my mind here. Cause cause if Kyle Klein, let's say Kyle Klein would have won worlds. I think he gets thrown into the equation of player of the year for some people, right? Cause now he won USCGC yeah. and worlds. So it's like, I don't know to, uh, the way I, the reason why I like it right now. And I think this is a good thing because we actually have conversation. You're going to have a bunch of people, right. you know, going for their, but going up for their, you know, their, who they're fans of and all this. I think it's an interesting conversation because just in, just in this, every, we're all kind of trying to figure out what we think it should mean. And I think that's a yeah. cool thing of like, everyone has a different idea. I mean, some people think a major is worth like four elite events. Like that's in their mind. That's what they think it should count for. Like one win, one major should win equal four elite. So it, it, it is a tight race. I think Isaac winning worlds made it a tight race. If it, if he didn't, I think Calvin, you run away with it pretty easily. Um, you're still my pick, but uh, I guess we'll see. Um, shifting. Do you, shifting, feel, do you, do you one last question do you yeah, feel yeah. like the best player on the planet like when you look at yourself in the mirror are you like i'm the guy to be every single weekend i'm the number one player in the world um that's a good question i don't i always, i guess i don't really ever self reflect like that i don't sure um well you don't have to cuz you go out there and you do it yeah i mean I know where I was all year and I know I was competing at the top, but I mean, also like my season was also kind of a function of what my goal was going in. And that was to stay present at every single event and every single round I played and never give up. And that's something I've had issues with kind of in the past where I've just like, you know, I, I, I would struggle and I'd be at a contention and I just would kind of check out, but I didn't want to do that this year. And I kind of proved to myself that I could do it, but it was also kind of like maybe the most mentally taxing year for that reason. Um, But yeah, I don't even remember what the question was, but it's just, you're, you're the player of the year. That's the thing. Um, (laughs) I do want to shout out Michael Taylor real quick. One of the, one of the tour life crew guys, 
this this is the key thing. We need to know who the media is. They have they have a media vote. We need to know who the media is and who they vote for. We can't be having people hide behind their votes and not have you know not being accountable. So that should be something that we should know. I think in the future. I don't think we will, but it should be. Um, all right. This was a question Wait, whoa, whoa. in it. Oh yeah. Well, I have one more question. Do you think that the world championship should just be eliminated? Um, Do you think it's a problem that there's one tournament that is just so high above all the others? Because you made a good point when you were saying I would trade any of my seasons for a world title. And that's kind of what our sport has done with the world championships is it's put it on this crazy high pedestal to where that is the end all be all for titles. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that is an issue in our, our current, whatever layout of our uh, tournaments like worlds does have higher precedent. Like it has the same, whatever designation as champions cup, European open and USCGC, but like you can look at anyone's, you know, bonus structure or pretty much anything related to how a company is going to view it. And worlds is basically worth double all those other ones. So um, yeah. I do think that's an issue. And I think part of it's just because of, you know, it's called the world championships. How, how is that not yeah. worth more than the United States disc golf championship or the European open, you know, like, like that. It, I mean, yeah, I don't know if it should be eliminated. I, I guess I don't, I don't know. I, I just think I, we need to start looking at it as like that is a major, just as much as everything else. Yeah. I mean, whether or not, you know, someone wants to win that one more or not, I guess that can be up for debate. Cause I don't know if in golf, like I'm sure people, they it's would rather win a green every, jacket, it's right? For like, everyone. Yeah. It's like, different is, for it, everyone. is it Gusto like the one everyone wants to win? I, no, no, no. There's, I mean, it depends. Like, if, you're, if you're, if you're a European player, like if you played in, in Europe growing up and stuff, the open is the one that you really want to win. Um, and then I would say some people it's, I would say it's a toss up for a lot between Augusta, the masters and the U S open. No one wants to win the PGA that, that, that's an <laughs> uh, okay. fourth. Um, but yeah, those three are all pretty much up there. It just depends on who you are, but the world championship, you're right. The world championship, it's, it's clear. It's, it's the number one and there really isn't a close number two. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's not money that decides it. I mean, the pro, the pro tour championships provides the biggest payout out of all of them. And, and I know, uh, Calvin, I don't know how you feel about this, but I would rather win any major compared to the pro tour championships personally. Yeah, I, I think currently at this stage, I would agree. I think the Pro Tour Championships could possibly build into something, maybe one day, but yeah. it's just kind of too new of an event. And it Switch really the hold. World Championships just to the Pro Tour Championships. Make it a major. There's our four majors. Problem solved, baby. I'm going to get roasted for this. Dang it. <laughs> yeah. I have said that. I was Shoot saying that they should, have, like, they should have worlds like every two years or something, and people didn't like that, but that would make it different from the other majors, I guess, than having it every year. It is a problem though. People don't want to say it, but it is a problem. Or we have the world championships, but it's a team event. And we just play the rest of the world. Hate that. Oh crap. Come on. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <hate that. laughs> um, all right. Uh, we got a question here from uh, Kevin uh, on Twitter. He wants to know, do pro tour points actually matter? Calvin was by far the points leader this year. And for that, he received a trophy and a stroke lead for tour championship for only two rounds. Should they find a better, uh, should they find a way to make tour points really matter or should they do away with them? And I wanted to add real quick on this too. Wasn't there like a certain point in time where like you couldn't gain any more points? Um, yeah. Like you so, almost had maxed your points out. So like playing tournaments didn't even matter. Bonkers. Yeah. So, I mean, do pro tour points matter? I mean, yes, you need them to get into the pro tour finale, which we're trying to do, but I mean, that's, there's so many parts to that. Do, do I think it truly mattered in the finale this year? Not really. Like, I, I mean, I basically had to play two rounds to get to the semis, which in years past, I just, got to buy to the semis. So they basically just made me play to get to where I used to get to for free. But like, 
it was it was basically a given with six strokes at Nevin. But um, I don't know. Currently, I don't I don't think it's really that big of a deal. Um, but I also think the points. If they want it to be a bigger deal, like either that strokes advantage needs to like exist throughout the entire event or there needs to be a separate payout. But I, I also think the points like the system we currently have is broken um, with drops. Like it, you have a points race and if you do good at the beginning, like you essentially have to start beating yourself in your prior events. And if someone else was doing bad at the beginning of the year, they can just gain on you even if you're playing better than them, which mm-hmm doesn't really make sense to me, but, um, I don't know. Well, it, it, let's, let's, let's jump in a little bit more on what you were talking about. The, the reset, were you a fan of the reset this year? Uh, no, I, I definitely wasn't a fan of the reset. Um, I would have told you that before the event, I, I honestly would have rather just gone in and played a four round tournament from scratch, even with everyone there than like, have a two round tournament. I, I just don't feel like it's basically when you have a two round tournament, if you get off hot the first round, you're kind of in the driver's seat, which we kind of saw, you know, it, I don't think it yields like that exciting of a tournament. You don't really give people a chance to, you know, come back from a mediocre round. Um, it's really just a, a sprint, which if that's what they w- would like, that that's cool. But I personally wasn't like the biggest fan of it. My thoughts, uh, as far as like tweaks, cause Jeff spring did say that they are probably going to bring this format back next year, but there will be some tweaks things that I would like to see is a bigger gap. So not necessarily a bigger gap between one and two. You can still, cause was, uh, was the gap only two strokes or was it one stroke? Did they go six to four or six to five? It was six to five. Six to five. Okay. So I might even like to see that go to two, but maybe go leader at 10 and then the bottom guys stay, still stay at even and then go kind of down the line there. And then four rounds, no reset, no cut. So everyone plays four rounds because there's only 30, you know, what 30, how many people made it this year? 32, 30, was it 32? 32. 32. There's only 32 people. There's no reason to cut the field to like, Hey, we need to cut the field and make sure they're like, no play 32 people, four rounds, and then a bigger separation of scores. Does that sound like something that's more exciting to play next year? Or am I off on something? Wait, so you're just saying bigger separation. No one gets cut. Everyone plays, no yeah. one gets cut all four rounds and uh, no reset. Uh, yeah, I mean, that could be exciting for sure. I mean, I I guess that's very similar to how the FedEx cup does it. Um, they pretty much have their, their handicaps and they go in and play a four, four, four round tournament. Um, I proposed a format to, to the pro tour as well. If like, they really enjoy their cuts, you could do a strokes advantage. And then every day you cut the bottom eight players. So then there's always oh. people fighting on the bottom and then there's always people fighting at the top to, to win as well. But both of those formats sound fine. I, I just, I feel like the reset kind of was a weird thing. It was like a, you're basically playing a mix between a stroke play and then like a bracket style tournament. And it just didn't feel very cohesive. And I don't think it worked as far as coverage wise goes because all the big names, like the top players in the field, we weren't even watching them like, Yeah, on, th- on day two for sure. Y- yeah. So you're not even seeing any of those guys shots and those are the people that people probably want to watch the most. So I don't, I don't think it ended up kind of working in their favor. So hopefully we see some tweaks with it uh, next year and hopefully get a little bit of a better product for everyone. Um, what were your thoughts, initial thoughts on the tour schedule for next year, starting in Florida, Kind of not too far away from you. Do you like do you like the uh, the way the tour is looking for next year? Uh, I mean, I do like that it starts an hour and a half from home. I mean, that is very convenient for me. But um, I honestly haven't looked at it in depth too much, so it's hard to really judge how it's laid out. I will say my biggest complaint with it is how back heavy it is. Uh, we mm-hmm. don't play a major until July, and I think. I don't, I I just don't feel like that's okay. I I, like the first half of the season just doesn't quite seem like it's 
really worth that much compared to the second half. So it's, I wouldn't be surprised to see people taking some time off in the first half just to make sure they're, they're healthy for the second half where it seems to be all the biggest events are. What was your favorite tournament um, that you played this year and wh which ones are you looking forward to the most next year? Um, I always enjoy playing Maple Hill. That's like my favorite course on tour. So that's a, an obvious one to go back to. Um, I've really enjoyed playing out in, in Norway at PCS. Um, oh, yeah. That's a pretty cool place to just to go and um, sightsee. And then um, other places that I enjoyed this year. Mm, I don't know. Nothing's come to the top of my head. I really do enjoy playing out at Northwood Black as well. That's uh, another yeah. one that I really enjoy playing. Yuli, do you have 10 minutes? You have 10 minutes left? Okay, I want to – Calvin, if you don't mind, you're going to co-host this. Just going to throw you on the spot. Yuli's going to have to leave here, but me and you will co-host it to finish up okay. the show. But I've got, uh, I've, got, I've got some good stuff here uh, to finish. So on Reddit, there was a post, and it said, boldest off-season predictions. And I went through and looked at the ones that kind of got upvoted the most and picked my favorites from there. So I want to hear both of your guys' initial reactions – to these bold off-season predictions. Okay. First one, my prediction is that this off-season is not going to be as exciting as the last few seasons. I think the COVID boom is officially over and it's for the most part back to normal. Don't expect any crazy contracts like in previous years. Let me tell you the free agents. Here are the free agents for this season. Paige Pierce, Nicholas Antilla, Matt Oram, Missy Gannon, Alden Harris, Chris Clemens, Bradley Williams, James Proctor, Gavin Babcock, Holland Hanley, and Aaron Gossage. Did you did you say Eagle McMahon? Well, I left off Eagle and uh, Gannon because those are like the two big big ones. I probably should have okay. said those as well. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, Eagle, yeah, you're probably, Eagle you're probably and sure. Gannon as well. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think? Are any big contracts, crazy things going to be happening from that list? Um, I, I would assume there's going to be some big things happening and definitely some shuffles. I think it might be, I mean, I don't know if there will be anything as exciting as like, you know, I don't even think Simon was up for, you know, renegotiation when he, when he moved. So like that was pretty out of nowhere and exciting, but I think it's going to be pretty interesting to see where everybody lands. Um, and kind of what everyone's looking for as far as like term of deal and everything. But, uh, I, I would say, I would say it's going to be pretty exciting. I'm really curious to see where everyone goes. Cause I, I really have no clue. I haven't talked to very many people about what their plans are. I think you're going to have big contracts that go out there. And I think you're going to be surprised with maybe some people who get a little snubbed. I think both are going to be out there. I, I, I think Gannon and, and um, Eagle are obviously, they have to sign big contracts. Um, and then I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if the there's a, enough money to go around now that these big contracts have gone out there with like Simon, Calvin, um, Ricky, you know, taking a lot of the market share as far as money that's available. So I'm, I'm curious to see what, how that works. It'll be very interesting to kind of see. All right. Next one, Yuli and big germ break up. They split custody over Nate Sexton. Uh, I'll let you address that first before I go to the next one. Yuli, thoughts on that? Uh, well, Jerem would never win custody in a in a lawsuit if we went to court. <laughs> I'm a way okay. suitable, more suitable father. I feel like no, I'm just <laughs> okay. uh, this next one. Uh, Lone Star Disc buys the molds for Lightning Disc and puts them back into production. I'm not familiar. Are you guys familiar with Lightning Disc? Um, yeah, that I remember throwing some of them a long time ago, but uh, I don't. I don't think they should. Okay. Okay. The roller. The roller was a <laughs> sick disc back in the day. I'll tell you that. Um, all right. This one a little more directed towards Calvin. Innova makes a run of Halo Birdies. I, I just don't see the demand there. I, I'm not seeing it. 
Okay. Uh, and then the last one from this guy, the Disc Golf Pro Tour Institute's dress code forcing caddies and players to wear matching outfits. Yuli, Brad and you, Brad would be all over that. If he, he, if that. he could match you, he would love that. Guy's electric with stuff like that, man. Whenever I wake up and he he's already dressed and then I come out and like all red, he's like, and we're matching. He's like, yeah, tiger red. That's our thing today. And he takes it to a whole nother level. So <laughs> um, <laughs> that would be, that'd be awesome. Okay. Next one. We got two more and then you you can bounce. Here we go. Disc golf pro tour makes DGN free on YouTube. They make more money attracting larger advertisers with the more views. Taylor Swift starts dating Matty O and disc golf explodes <laughs> worldwide. <laughs> It's definitely happening. How do we feel I about this see, one? <laughs> I can't see how all this doesn't happen. Like that's a tipping point for sure. Okay. Yeah. I mean, honestly, Matty O Taylor Swift. People were going nuts that she can wear heels. You can wear heels with Matty O. Matty O's a tall yeah. fella. Um, and then t- he could take her to Alabama football games. I mean, I think it could work for sure. Uh, all right, last one here. Calvin starts a mass social media hype train by doing stand-up comedy. That's a bold prediction. <laughs> I'll tell you. I'll tell you this. People don't. Well, a lot of people know, but most people from the outside don't know. Calvin's freaking hilarious. One of the smartest people I've ever met in my life, and his humor definitely reflects um, his smarts for sure. Have you ever done an open mic, Calvin? I've never done an open mic. So hmm. I, might, I might have to start looking into this. I was going to say, maybe, maybe that's the thing is you have to do an open mic or you have to start a Twitter account. You have maybe, to pick one. Maybe I post short segments like on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, you do, yeah. maybe you start your comedy career <laughs> on Twitter. Okay. I could see it. Um, all right, Yuli, we'll let you go, brother. Appreciate you. All right. Guys, I appreciate it. Calvin, man, congrats on the season. Thank you. Um, I'm rooting for you. I appreciate the insight from both of you. I have officially changed my mind. Calvin, you deserve it. And best of luck. Uh, best of luck in 2024 as well. Look Heck forward yeah. to seeing you out there. Yes, sir. You got his vote, Calvin. You got his vote. That's what we were looking for. There's one. See you guys. Wait, guy is he, is he a media vote? <laughs> I think we get player votes. Do we not? Do we not get a vote on anything? I don't know. I'm just getting slammed with this comeback player of the year email. Like I've gotten it 10 times to nominate someone. Who am I nominating? I nominate. I, I nominated Isaac though. So I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I don't think Yuli knows what any of these awards actually mean. I think that's what I'm starting to realize. I feel like, I feel like oh, yeah, Yuli is yeah. a good candidate for comeback player of the year. Oh, Dark Horse Yuli. Dark Horse. I got to yeah. get out of here. Man. Right. Yeah, Rick, Rick, you guys are trolling Ricky's my most improved. Party. Ricky's my most improved player. There you go, I'll Yuli. I'll see you guys. All right. Um, all right. A few things left on the docket here, Calvin, that we can run through. And I would love to get your perspective on these. Okay. This was sent in by someone, uh, local course to them. I don't know what course this was. Could be a disaster, though the city decided to put a playground and we'll have size throw it up here real quick. They put a playground right in between the T pad and the basket. And then we can show you the reverse angle from the baskets perspective. Okay. If you, if this is your local course, what are you skipping this hole or are you throwing a big hyzer? What if you're like, course record potentially right now and you come to this hole and you've got billy on the swing getting pushed by his mom what happens here yeah if billy's on the swing i'm i'm out there's no way i'm i'm playing that hole there's way too much that could go wrong <laughs> that, okay that so seems like uh skipping yeah, that, it completely yeah that hole needs to be redesigned <laughs> okay something completely different um did you see that you just came out with this new round rating thing have you seen this uh, I think I did hear about that. I haven't gotten a chance to like check it out. Um, is it is it just essentially they give out their own round rating for, you know, your self inputted rounds? Yeah. So you put your rounds in. You have to be connected to some sort of form of internet, I think. But you put your rounds in, and at the end of your round, it calculates a number, and the number can be anywhere from, I believe, 
I believe zero to 300 plus and okay. they've created ranges for what like a, a, a beginner would shoot, what an intermediate advanced a pro. I, uh, I didn't read into it too much. I went out and played uh, around at my local course and I shot decent. I didn't, it's, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a pitch and putt pretty much course. Right. And I shot pretty much decent. Someone showed me that my round rated like 60 points higher than Ricky's round 10 under at Nevin. So there are, (laughs) so there are some kinks in it for sure. Um, but what are you, what are your thoughts on having as of right now, everyone's just PDGA rating. What are your thoughts on having like something come out like this to maybe put a little bit of uh, competition out there in the, uh, the rating world? Um, I mean, I think, I think it's cool. I mean, there's a ton of like casual disc golfers out there that, you know, maybe use U disc and, you know, aren't always out there playing PDGA tournaments. So if there's like a system that kind of gives them a better idea of how their skills are stacking up, um, between their scale and like the pdj scale and i'm sure that'd be super fun for them uh i don't like see it as like a super useful tool for a professional but like i think it's a really cool thing for you know all the casual golfers out there that don't necessarily have the time to dedicate a full weekend or even like a long weekend to a tournament one thing that i think would be very useful and maybe it doesn't happen that often in disc golf because even when i play with like my buddies and stuff the majority of rounds are like casual rounds. They're not really like actually trying to beat each other. They're just trying to like play against the course, which maybe that's a disc golf thing and not because that doesn't really exist actually in golf as much. So maybe this wouldn't make any sense for disc golfers, but I think it would be cool to have a rating system to where it actually be more like stroke based. So when me and you go to a course, you put your number in, I put my number in and then it generates like, okay, Calvin, you get, uh, six strokes on this course and I get, uh, 15. So then if me and you are playing, then I'm going to get nine strokes. So that is like how to make it fair for our skill Uh levels to play that course. I think that would be somewhat useful but again i don't know maybe maybe there's just not that demand for like having something to be able to give strokes on certain courses do you find that the same when you play with people locally um yeah i mean i i feel like most of the time i'm playing i'm playing a casual round i'm not necessarily you know out there scoring but I, i could see where that could be pretty pretty interesting as well you know being able to generate a handicap depending on who you're playing against and and the course because I think all that kind of does matter um, as far as what the handicap might be. But um, I think that'd be super fun. And I think that would be entertaining to actually go out there and compete against your friends with a handicap. It would make it exciting for everybody. Yeah. All right. We just got a $10 dono from the Aquarian TV. So I'm just going to throw this question right at you. Does completely unplugging and not playing in the off season for a while hurt or help? Um, I I think there is a portion like here, you know, right now where I definitely will take a little break and it definitely helps just kind of reset and really just kind of get a bunch of other things in life in order. Um, but I, I still do play in the off season, you know, and it just slowly ramps up as you get closer and closer to the season. So I, I do think you need to be playing, you know, for a good, good period of time before the season starts to make sure you're sharp and all your, your skills are there. But I definitely do think there is a a place for, you know, rest and time to get away from the game. All right. This question was posed by a disc golf fanatic on Twitter, and I'm going to tweak it a little bit. So the question was, you have 24 hours to make an ACE from 300 feet for $1 million. If you don't do it, you can't play disc golf ever again. Now that obviously you're taking that you, I mean, you've, how many ACEs did you have on season this year? I just had uh, one ace, you know, on during the tour season, but I had a couple other throw-ins. I thought you had two aces at least. No, you only had one. Mm. What about Northwoods practice round? How many? Oh yeah, <laughs> I forgot about those. <laughs> um, they, they okay, so you're video. <laughs> so you're clearly taking the three hundred dollars, right? That's not even a, or not the three hundred. You're you're clearly taking that bet. Three hundred feet. You have twenty four hours to ace. You're clearly taking that. Yeah, so I what I, I want to know 
is we're going to take out the, you never get to play disc golf again. Cause that's to me, that's lame. We're now we're throwing you in jail. Actually, no, we're going to throw you in prison. Prison's worse. We're throwing you in prison for one year. So one year of prison. What? I still think you're doing 300 feet, right? I think, I think I could do 300 feet. I think, you know, I find a 300 foot wide open hole. Yeah. It's a wide open hole, wide open hole. You have 24 hours. The question I have, because I think 300 feet is a no-brainer. One year in prison, what, where do you stop? At what point do you say, I'm not doing that? What, how far? What's your max? My max distance down that, that bet would probably be 350. You're I not doing 400 nope. with a little eagle? No, nope, definitely not. 24 hours? Do you know how many times you could throw at that? A lot, but do you know how different your throw is going to be at hour 18 than it is on hour one? Well, hopefully you don't. Yeah, hopefully you don't have to deal with hour 18. I know, hopefully you don't, but. Wait, this person's telling me that jail's way worse than prison? Wait, do I have it backwards? I don't know. I haven't been to either yet, so. (laughs) (laughs) I love how you said yet. Um, I thought I could have sworn prison was worse than jail. I'm going to have to do some research after this. Um, All right, moving on. Next question. Uh, This comes from Christopher Sanders. He says, uh, I know you said you were retired from this, but would you please rate this trophy? My buddy slippery saucers put together for an upcoming tournament. Like I said, I am retired. I can't rate trophies, but Calvin is here to take the, uh, the, the, the mantle for me. So here, Calvin, I want you to give your rating out of 10 of these okay. trophies. Silas, roll through the photos. MA3 first play. Oh, it's a Halloween tournament. Yep. Um, Wait, you got to see all the photos. You got more. Okay. You got to roll through the photos. We got another one here, the backside, or that's, I don't know what that is. That might be this. Su- all right. Do we have the video size? Can you show Calvin the video? There is a video that shows what these look like when they're in their full display. We don't have the video. That's fine. You can put light, uh, like a, like a lamp, like a la- uh, okay. pump. What do, you, what do you call those? Jack-o'-lantern? Yeah. Basically a jack-o'-lantern essentially. Mm-hmm. So what, okay. what are we rating this? Um, you know, I'm seeing, I'm guessing this is, you know, a local like B tier or something, maybe a C tier. And I, I think the tier of the event does does matter for this rating. Um, it is the um, Bootastic Banana Open. Shout out! Um, I'll give it. I'll give it a solid seven. Okay, solid I'm seven. Give it seven out of ten because, like, if this was my trophy for an elite series, it would be <laughs> much lower. But seeing as it's most likely a fun local tournament. Fun little Halloween pretty, tournament. I think it's pretty cool. You know, you'd probably be pretty happy if you won the event and you got your little Halloween trophy when you won, you know, the Halloween event. That's a good rating. Good rating. You might have a uh, career in rating trophies. Um, this is from Ign- Ignacio. Based on the fact that Hunter can't beat 68 at New London, what do you think the average pro score would be? So to catch up all the people listening and maybe Calvin as well, Hunter has been, has been doing a series at the course, new London, which will host the 2024 world championships. And his goal is to break 68, which is the par. So he's just trying to shoot under one under par or better. He's been doing this. If I think he's been doing it all year, I could be wrong, but it feels like he's been doing it all year. I think he attempts it once every month and he's never gotten close. Like he just never has gotten even sniffing it. Um, Calvin, I know you, I don't think you, did you play new London on your way down to USCGC? I have not. I've never, I've never played new London. I, I don't even think I've watched any coverage of it. So I'm not very familiar with, uh, the course. I just I throw out know. a number, just throw, throw out a number. What do you, what do you think the average pro? And then I'll throw my number. I've played it a couple times. So with the average, what, what do you pro? Think the average pro, yep. New London. So are you just asking like what the average is going to be? Like when we go through for worlds? Yeah, we'll say that. That's that should be fine. Um. Oh wait, but Worlds is like weird. It's got so many players, so it's going to be worse than normal. Um, I don't really know how a good Hunter is either, but I'm going to say it's going to average over par. Yeah, 
I think I'm going to say the, I'm going to say 72 will be okay, the four, average at the world over. championships. Okay. I'm going to go I'm going to go uh 74. Okay. I'll say so 74. Really um now if it was a lead event, I would probably go more on the side of like one under one okay. one to even I would say, but like you said with it being worlds, there will be a bunch of people that uh that that absolutely just blow up out there. You will see double digits on hole ten or on hole six. There will be really? people that take double digits on that hole Man. for sure. Um, all right. Next question here is uh, oh we, we we got another one from the Aquarian TV. Is Calvin allowed to sign a Brixton card if some random if some rando brought him one? Yeah, I can I can sign the Brixton card. Right. You can do it. There you go. All right, this is from Greg G. J. Barber. Would love to hear what big off-season plans you and Yuli have. You, you are now uh-huh. Yuli. And if there's any opportunities for finan- fans to connect with you guys. How can they connect, Calvin? Um, well, they want to know. You know, currently I, I don't have like any huge off-season plans as far as uh, connecting with the fans. Uh, that could change, you know. I... I uh, I've had some some ideas bouncing around with you know maybe doing a podcast or something with Melton or you know maybe some YouTube videos. I'm not really sure. They're, those are still uh, you know very early infancy stages of being in the works. But um, I, I guess I would say my biggest off season plan is I, I am seriously house hunting this off season. So oh heck yeah, I'll probably um, be getting on that here in in the next week or so. So. Um, that's probably my biggest plan, but that has nothing to do with connecting with fans. You trying to stay in the same area? Yeah, I'm looking to stay down here in, you know, Pinellas County, Florida. All right. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, for me, I am I is I is kind of re-upped my Twitch account. So I'm streaming most weekdays, I would say. I'm gonna actually jump on there after this. So twitch.tv slash Brody Smith, if you wanna see me play some risk do you ever do you dabble in risk is that a game of choosing i haven't in a while i think i did have it on my phone at one point yeah you know a while ago it's probably still there honestly i just don't think i've played it in a while i i have heard you uh talking about it a lot here the past couple months you know i had a five hour game last night calvin five hour game dang yeah what's your uh, what's your rank now I'm a master. You're I'm a not master. grandmaster you yet. Made it to grandmaster yet. Okay. I'm working on it. I'm I'm playing some different uh, settings right now, and it's it's kicking my butt a little bit, but it has been fun. So you can catch me on Twitch, and then obviously you guys can catch me on all the uh, social platforms as well. Um, There's a good one. Short arm golfer. He wants to know beans and chili or no. This seems like a no brainer, right? Um, I, I like beans and chili. <laughs> Like, I don't yes. think who doesn't like beans and chili. I feel like it doesn't. I don't know. I, get, I think some people think of chili and they think of like the chili you put on like a, a chili dog. And in which case there's not really ever beans in that. I don't know. Yeah. Did you do, uh, did you do skyline chili in, uh, for Idlewild? I did not. I, I've had, uh, I've had skyline in the past. Um, but I did not, I did not revisit decent it's not my favorite i mean they they throw their their chili on pasta and then they put a mountain of cheese on top of it yeah i mean it's it's tough to make anything taste bad with that much cheese i guess you could say but for sure um yeah it is what it is all right um so we talked earlier too about uh the spectator numbers being super low did you notice that when you were out there did you notice that there was way less people at the tour championship this year than there was last year um there, i definitely did notice like there weren't like a ton of people out there this year i i guess i didn't really think think about it or compare it to last year um okay i also i wasn't out there at the course the final day last year either so i don't i don't know what the you numbers know, what, were, what the numbers looked like out there, but um, gotcha. I did notice that this year's was you know kind of kind of lackluster, and I, I don't know what the ticket prices were, but I think it's also probably just a little bit to do with it's 
right after, you know, USDGC and that's whatever, 35, 40 minutes away. So I, yeah. I feel like it's a tough ask to ask people to spend, you know, back to back weekends watching disc golf or just really anything for that matter. It's not often you see anyone, you know, dedicate that much time back to back weekends to one individual thing. It's definitely a lot to ask. Um, MVP sometimes gets slammed, you know, every year when it, you know, it's, it's time to sign up to volunteer. It seems like they always, you know, there's always posts about their, uh, their, you know, you have to pay to volunteer at MVP and there was some spectator or volunteer issues at Nevin this year with, you know, some volunteers just not showing up. And there was a post we talked about earlier. And I, I was curious what, how the PGA tournament or how PGA tournaments do it. Because if you have ever been out to a PGA tour event, there are so many volunteers all over the place. And so I looked this up. Now this is granted from a sports illustrated article back in 2020. So things might've changed between now and then, but it says that, uh, you pay to be a volunteer as well. $75 or more for a hat, a shirt, a water bottle, a hot dog, and a soft drink while working and four tickets to the tournament that you can't give away. So that might be like the future of like getting more volunteers out is having them pay something to be able to volunteer, but then getting stuff in return. Do you think yeah. that's a good way of going about it versus just like a, Hey, just put your name on a list and then show up. Um, it's a good question. I don't know. I guess it, it would feel a little weird paying to volunteer, but I guess like four free ticket, like when you say you can't give those away, what does that mean? Like, why do you need four tickets then? Uh, I think it's like, so you can give like me, I, that might be like not to be able to sell maybe or something. Okay. I, I mean, mean, you I, have to have people come into the tournament with you maybe. So okay. like your friends, they're like, you want, they want you to give that friends and family, I'm guessing something along those lines. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it seems like a pretty reasonable trade-off at that point. Um, and I, I could definitely see that, you know, maybe being implemented in the future. I know it, it seems to work at MVP. I mean, they have their fair share of volunteers. And I mean, it's not too different than kind of what we have going now. I mean, I think you just volunteers get, get some stuff for volunteering mm -hmm. as well. They should. Like, a little swag bag. Yeah, I think they Something might like get that. like a shirt or something. I, I don't know exactly what it is, but um, yeah, I'd be interested to see. I, I don't, I don't know if people would still volunteer if they had to pay for it, but maybe if you know they felt the value was there with the tickets, then they would. Yeah, you could do like a, you could do like a sign disc by like a handful of pros or something. I don't know. It, yeah. I, I, I just don't think you want to get in a situation like you just have half the volunteers not show up. And now all of a sudden the, the tournament's going to be run more poorly or whatever because of it. But I thought that was interesting. Um, all right. Last topic. This one's probably the juiciest of all of them. So Calvin, if you want to take a seat uh, or you want to sit out on this one and let me, uh, let me run it. You let me know. Um, so this was, this was a, a product of more, coverage. And I think this is something that we all are going to have to deal with. The more coverage, the more video, the more microphones are out because I wouldn't say this is the first time anything like this has happened. This won't be the last time. And I think it was just, it was just caught because there was a standalone camera on hole 18 that had a hot mic. And what I'm talking about is the Katrina Allen and Jessica Weiss situation that went down on hole 18. Are you familiar with this story at all? Yeah, I, I, uh, I did hear about this story, you know, the, the day it happened. Um, so I am, I am familiar with, with what went down between the two of them and, you know, tensions seem to have gotten pretty high there. So I'll, I'll try to give as much information that I know. And since you were on the grounds, you might be able to fill in some gaps or correct me if I'm wrong, but I did reach out to, uh, both parties. I did reach out to Katrina Allen to get comment. I did reach out to Jessica Weiss and from, from the looks of it. And this is also what the, uh, the UDIS, the one that was scoring from the looks of it, the main issue here was Jessica thought she got a score, I believe an eight Katrina thought she got a 10. And I think also Ella uh, thought she also got a 10. 
And obviously on Holy Team, there's a lot of OB. There's a lot of, you know, situations there. So I think Jessica was struggling or, you know, took a little bit longer, I guess, or something to count up her score. And when she did, it ended up that no one was right. And her score was actually a nine instead of a 10 and an eight. And it seemed like some tensions um, were kind of high throughout the round. Um, Katrina made it seem like it wasn't that big of a deal when she texted me back. Um, it seemed like Jessica took a little bit more of offense to some of the words that were said. And if you're interested in like the actual stuff that was said, you can go to the disc golf pro tours, YouTube channel. The video is still up there and uh, it's the live stream on Holy teen. If you really are, are curious, but it did seem like words were said between the two and um, you know, ended up having people storm off. I reached out to Ella Hansen as well, who also was one of the people, I don't know who the fourth, per- fourth person was, but Ella did not see my Instagram DM. So I didn't get a response from her. Um, what I'll say, th- is that all right so far from what you heard? Yeah, I mean, that, that seems pretty, pretty right. Um, you know, I, I, I know there was definitely some conflict with their score. I, my first like introduction to the whole situation was actually just sitting there watching the, the U-Disc live scoring. Um, you know, the actual live stream was, was down at this point in time, I think. So like you couldn't actually watch coverage. And like, I was kind of just waiting to see who was on the bubble and who was going to make it in FPO to, you know, to, you know, the finals in round three. But you were, if you were sitting there watching U-Disc, Jessica Wiese's score was just like fluctuating everywhere. Like they were, there was UDIS scores submitted, I feel like, everywhere from like a double bogey to maybe a quadruple bogey or maybe even even worse on that hole. And it just kept changing and it kept like backing out farther. It was really wild to watch. And then like to have like no live stream to be able to like back any of it up. Like that's kind of how I first got introduced to the situation because then I like was messaging some other people. I was like, Do you know what's going on on this right now? Like <laughs> but um yeah, it yeah, seems like for those they're... that don't know, Jessica Weiss was going into hole 18. She was far within the cut line. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously now she's, depending on if she would have gotten an eight or a 10, uh, and ultimately she ended up getting a nine, she ended up missing the cut by one, which yeah. cost her also $1,500, $1, right? So I think that might have played into it. You're probably not super thrilled and happy that you just yeah. played poorly on the final hole and lost your, you know, lost yourself 1500, potentially even more. Right. Yeah. I, I think that probably had a lot to do with it. You know, Jessica's probably flustered with, you know, how she just played the final hole and, you know, not, not realizing, or maybe she did realize she was, she played herself out of it. I, I mean, Kat, Katrina's probably really frustrated that, you know, she played herself out of it as well. I know she was inside that cut line at one point during the round and then, um, yeah, I think, yeah, you said, yeah, Ella was on the card. I know she played herself out, or I don't know if she was really in it ever, but I know she didn't play great. But, and I, oh, the fourth person was uh, Stacy Ronsley. And she, I oh, guess, who, who, who got she in. just made it in based on. Because of that. Wow. Because of that. <laughs> so, um, oh yeah, my I, gosh. I, I could see that whole situation being pretty tense. You know, it's the last event of the year. And, you know, there's a big cut going into the next round. All right. So two questions on this one. Do you think more of this stuff is going to come up now that we are having like hot mics? We are having just cameras, you know, we're not having a camera in your face, right. On coverage, Mm -hmm. this situation, the camera was just shooting the basket. And so if you weren't aware of the camera, like that, that was rolling live, you might not know like, Oh man, I shouldn't say this, this, is this something that you think is uh, going to happen more down the road? Um, stuff getting caught on hot mics or, you know, I, think, I mean, stuff like this. Yeah. It's certainly more probable. The more cameras you have out there, the more likely it, you know, they are to catch something that they might not have in the past. But I mean, there's generally plenty of stuff that happens on the course. that's just, you know, not caught on camera. So I think more of it will happen. I, I don't think there's, you know, big, you know, confrontations like this necessarily very often. Um, I could be wrong. I just don't, I don't feel like I run across. I don't very hear often. about them yeah. like this. So, yeah. 
So I, I wouldn't say necessarily this will, will happen as often, but I think you'll definitely catch some, some blurbs of, of things being said as there's more cameras on more people. Second question, follow up. Is this, this is something that, you know, foundation has been, uh, you know, given the name TMZ sometimes with some of the stuff we discuss. Do you think this is a fair play story for media or are things like this shouldn't be talked about? Um, I think it's fair play. I mean, it happened at the event on the event grounds, like before scores were even finalized. So I, I don't, I don't see why it's not fair play. It, it's really, it's realistically part of the event. And, um, you know, I mean, media is there just to, to generate stories. So, you know, now we got Jessica Weiss, Katrina Allen beef, maybe, you know, you know, is it, is it gonna, is it gonna affect play in the future? I don't know. <laughs> Tune in to find out. T Tune into Calvin uh, Heinberg and Zach Melton's podcast this off season to uh, get the details on that. Um, yeah. All right. Well, that's all I got, Calvin. Hey, I think everyone uh, loved you sitting in. I think you did a fabulous job. I think if I was Yuli, I'd be worried about his job and his uh, security and on this show moving forward. Um, but uh, do you have anything else for the people before you go? Uh, anything to say, anything like any projects, any disc, any, anything to, for the people to follow you? Um, I mean, nothing really different than normal, you know, thanks for, you know, watching and, you know, making it all possible, you know, if it wasn't for everyone out here, you know, absorbing and consuming all the content and disc golf, you know, I wouldn't have a job here. So I really am thankful for everyone. And, um, yeah, if you'd like to support me, you know, you can, you can check out all my, my discs, whether it's at Innova Millennium, Flight Factory, Squatch Bags. So, um, yeah, I'd like to thank all those people and, and you guys for, for making this a, a reality. Heck yeah. All right, Calvin. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. And uh, hopefully I'll, I'll see you maybe this off season when I, when I head to Florida at some point. All right, sweet. Yeah. Keep me in the loop. Unless you want to come to a Raiders game, brother. I got, I got a ticket every game. The offer's on the table. All right. I you may let, take you, you let me know. That. You let me know what home game you want to go. And honestly, if Zach wants to go too, I can, I can get a third ticket as well. So okay. you, you let me know. We can do All a little right. Vegas trip. All right. I'll keep you right, on that. That sounds like fun. I hope we see you on wrist too. So. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Have a good night. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Calvin Heinberg, uh, one of my favorite guests that we have on the show. And it's always a pleasure to get the uh, ability to hear exactly his thoughts and stuff on that as well. All right. A couple of housekeeping things here. Tour life crew, baby going live and uh, uh, going strong as ever. Appreciate you guys. We're going to have a tour life crew only uh, stream coming up for members only. And then we'll have a, um, another Q and a, I think at some point at the end of this month as well. So thank you for all the tour life crew, everyone in the chat. Appreciate all you guys a lot. Uh, Spotify and Apple listeners. This is a shout out to all you Spotify and Apple listeners. We are at 578 reviews on Spotify and 148 reviews on Apple. Thank you so much for everyone uh, that has dropped a review and is enjoying tour life. We appreciate all the continued support from you guys. Tour life job interviews. We're moving forward, folks. We are getting close. Next, uh, this week, I'm kind of reviewing. We, we just went through the second process where they sent in some clips and some potential social media posts. So I'm going through those. Next week will be the interviews. And those will be shown, not live. I don't think we're going to do them live because I think that's going to be rough. But I think we're going to chop together the interviews and put them on the Foundation Podcast YouTube channel right here. And I would love to hear your guys' thoughts because I think that has an impact, right? This is a position that, yes, they're going to be managing most of the social media on Tour Life, but they also might potentially be a third microphone at some point here. So I would love to kind of get an idea from what you guys like as well. Is Hunter going to be their boss? Yikes. Well, I will... They will report to me. Um, so, yeah. So, they, they won't have to. Well, I mean, who knows? We'll see. 
Uh, all right. That is going to be that. Hey, South Toe coming in hot, uh, hot here with the Tour Life Crew Recruit. Appreciate you. Silas, appreciate you behind the boards doing all that you do. And uh, we appreciate all you guys listening. Really, we do. This was a fun um this was a fun idea that I had at the beginning of the season because I really wanted to somehow be involved more in the growth of disc golf and try to give the stories that need to be talked about a platform, try to give some players that I think deserve a bigger platform. And you guys have really made this show into something absolutely special. We're going to continue it this off season. We've got some awesome guests coming up and uh, we can't wait to see. And if disc golf is headed the way that it's been headed the last several months, I can't wait to kind of see what next storylines break for us to cover right here on tour life. And with that being said, we'll see you guys next week. <laughs>